Welcome to The Long and Short. Maestro here. Thank you for tuning in. Every day on this channel, we try to make you a better crypto trader by showing you smart money price action trading techniques from a long and a short-term perspective. Doesn't matter if you're a long-term trader or a short-term trader, we have some tricks up our sleeves to show you guys. What you've tuned in today is our introduction to our first major tutorial, how to be a successful crypto trader, right? Ultimately, I think this is something that everyone wants to know how to do. And this tutorial is going to walk you through it from start to finish, pretty much from a bad trader to a good trader's perspective. I did take a lot of bumps in this market, and I do have a lot of perspective to share. And hopefully this does help you out on your journey as well. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. First things first, let's talk about who I am. Well, I started as a very bad trader. I did have a lot of knowledge of financial markets and the way that Forex stock markets work. Getting into crypto was sort of a, a brand new introduction for me. And I started off as a losing trader. I had around a 25% to 30% win percentage. And my longest streak was around 12 losses in a row. And we have some evidence to show that. I consistently experienced all types of negative emotions when it came to trading. Not only fear, anxiety, doubt, but rage, almost complete rage, ready to throw things across the room. Like I've experienced that in trading. Okay, so I've been to the extreme lows as well as some of the extreme highs of trading just experienced within the past year. Okay, so we're going to share some of that experience and what it actually took for me to break out of the losing trader mode into a winning trader mode. Eventually, I became indifferent, but I didn't want to stop. Right? I didn't give up. I did a lot of greed and revenge trading, right? Like I lost trades because I got too greedy in them and price reversed on me. I took revenge trades when I shouldn't have and got very emotional in the market. But eventually I started to become a winning trader. My longest win streak is 10 wins in a row. I'm currently sitting at an 80 to 90% win percentage. And I'm consistently overcoming these things like fear, anxiety, doubt, greed, all of these emotions that kept me in bad trades before. And I've developed a lot of confidence in regards to the decisions that I've made, all right, and that I'm making in the market. So how do you go from 25% win percentage to 85% win percentage? All right, we're going to break all of this down in this tutorial today. This is essentially how I started. Now, this is my Bybit account. And if you look at the date to the far right there, you can see some of these trades were taken, you know, in the summer going into the fall. And I was getting wrecked in the market. Granted, these are very small wins and losses here that you're seeing, really all losses that you're seeing. But I was playing the market in a certain type of way. I didn't want to put a bunch of money in, right? I was smart enough not to dump a whole bag into the market and go crazy and trade on a bunch of leverage. I was trying different things out. But everything that I was trying, I was losing with. So a 12 trade loss streak is something that you're not going to enjoy no matter how small the amount of money is that you're losing, right? I eventually got to a point where I said, you know what? Just hit the pause button, reset, go back to the drawing board and relearn some things or learn other things that are going to help you in this market rather than hurt you, okay? So this was the first experience and how I started, but eventually I got around to doing things like this, right? Now, this is recent. This is in March, okay, started this month. You can see the win percentages have dramatically changed. Now, how do you go from last year in the summer to March, right? How do you go from losing almost 100% of your trades to winning almost 100% of your trades? This is what this tutorial is gonna dive into today. Not only my transition, but how I did it. So. We have a few different goals here that we're looking to achieve when it comes to this tutorial. We want to share what made us successful for sure, right? So this tutorial has a few goals that we're going to break down. We're going to break down the steps to accelerate your learning curve in crypto trading based on trial and error experience. We're going to talk about the mistakes we made and we're going to tell you how to avoid those mistakes. We're going to help you build an optimized watch list with target levels for long-term trade execution. What this means is that we're going to build a watch list we're eventually going to turn that into a portfolio, but we're not just going to get in at any specific time. We're going to set up some specific levels, even automate this system to get you into a place where you're building a portfolio, but in a smarter way, rather than just jumping in because someone said you should invest in a cryptocurrency. All right. We're going to provide a process to automate this, like we said before. Right. And we're going to do this with limit orders on your exchange. We're going to provide insight on how to eliminate the emotional impulses like fear and greed from your trading. There's a very specific way that I went about doing this. And I think that 
by sharing some of this with guys. You know, you'll be able to pick this up and kind of bring this into your trade mold as well, right? And we also want to provide an actionable plan and approach to crypto trading that you can begin to execute today, even if you're just starting today. So if you have no experience, you've never done any of this before, you can watch this tutorial through and through and you'll be able to figure out what to do in this market. So what does this break down to? Ultimately, we're going to have a series of videos that are going to touch on the following subjects. This is the introduction. The next thing we're going to talk about is building that watch list. Number three will be marking the targets on that watch list. Number four will be mastering the trade and the trader. Not only do you have to know how to push these buttons, you have to know how to control yourself as you push these buttons as well. That's a very important part that we're going to focus very deeply on in this tutorial. And then eventually we'll talk about the actual portfolio, building that portfolio, maintaining that portfolio, getting in and out of positions in that portfolio, right? And how you should track things moving forward. Every winning trader has an evolution. No matter what anyone says, nobody starts off in this game knowing what to do. This is the iceberg of essentially what it takes for you to be a good trader. Now, when you first come into the market, right, you're going to have certain opinions, and that's going to be based on a number of different things, charts, news media, your friends, social media. You're going to have an idea of what you want to invest in and what you think is going to be good to, to do in this market, just based on what you see, right? Most traders they're gonna start off in a losing mode. And here's what I mean by that. When you first start trading, you usually do not understand the emotional concepts or sort of freight trains that you'll run into when it comes to trading, all right? So things like fear, things like greed, things like anxiety, you'll hear these terms, right? FUD, FOMO. You'll hear a lot of this, but if you don't necessarily know what it means, it's just how the market plays with your emotions. When you first start trading, you're not necessarily sure how emotions play into the bigger realm of things until you experience yourself trading, until you take a position. Once you take a position, then it starts to become very clear and apparent to you how your emotions become involved. But by that point, you may be losing money. The typical experience for new traders is that they will lose some money as they start. Not all traders start off this way. And usually those are the traders who went a little bit in the beginning, but end up losing some money anyway, because they sort of found some good fortune at the start and they didn't know how to maintain that good fortune as time continued to roll on because of course they continued to get bad knowledge. Okay, bad knowledge is basically OTA, and we've covered this in plenty of other videos, right? And I called it OTA, it's just basically the, the traditional method of technical analysis. Things like chart patterns, things like following indicators, things like trend lines, right? Support and resistance. Some of these concepts are meant to actually set you up in the market. And ultimately what all good traders have is a paradigm shift. Eventually, through trial by fire, trial and error, they're going to figure out the things that work in this market versus the things that do not work in this market. Now, some traders, it's going to take years for them to get there. Now, what we're trying to do is expedite that for you as a trader, no matter if you're a long term or short term trader. We're trying to expedite this paradigm shift. Right. And the main thing that you need to understand is it just all goes back to bad knowledge. OK, which is why you're losing money, which is why you're emotional. And it just goes both ways, up and down that left side of the paradigm. Now, once you have that shift, things start to change. You start to obtain better knowledge. It can be through any system, okay? But you're learning your chart patterns better, or you're drawing your trend lines and in, in your channel lines in a much more strategic way, all right? Or you're learning things like we're teaching here, which is institutional methods, smart money techniques, things like imbalance, liquidity, how to read the price action. You start to run into better knowledge, which eventually turns you into a winning trader, which is where you're going to make some money. But that's only achieved after the trial by fire. And the only way that you're really able to surface over the sort of the bottom line of that iceberg is if you're able to control your emotions, conquering the fear, conquering the greed, conquering the anxiety of what it is to trade. If you're able to do that, you can swing from a bad trader to a good trader in no time. So let's dive deeper into how this actually works. All right. We're going to go on a bit of a journey here. We have a bit of a path that we're going to take in order to get you from point A to point B. 
The first is we're going to build this watch list. Now, this is going to get you involved in doing a little bit of research, not only on the project, but on the people as well. So we're going to talk about that, right? But this is the starting point of your analysis, right? You want to identify some projects. You want to look at things of interest to you. The second thing is that we're going to mark off some targets, areas of interest for trade entry and exit based on price action for these things that we find interesting in the market. Number three, we're going to master the trade itself, things that we should do to enter and exit and maintain that trade. But we're also going to talk about mastering the trader because trading psychology, overcoming the fear, the greed, the anxiety, and building some institutional logic into your brain on how to enter and exit this market is really all it takes for you to become a winning trader from a losing trader. And then ultimately execution. We're going to automate trades via limit orders. And this is a very easy way for you to kind of set it and forget it and get away from the market and not concentrate so much on things that are happening. Or we're going to execute trades live via market orders. Executing via market orders, there's a couple of other things that go along with that. But this is our path. This is how we're going to take you from just being a watcher to an actual person that's executing in the market, start to finish. And once you do that, eventually you'll get to the point where you're climbing up the higher ladder of crypto investments and you can start to make some really good moves in this market. Here's the details of what we're going to cover for each section. For the watch list, we're going to talk about portfolio allocations, how much you should have, you know, and we really base it on market cap in regards to risk. Also, we're going to talk about research, where you can find information, building this watch list up, and then best practices for organizing this watch list, okay? Depending on how your portfolio looks and the things that you're watching, you want to organize your watch list so that when you come to it, you have a full understanding of where you stand in the market. When it comes to targets, we're going to talk about some of the basics of marking targets, on trading view this is the platform that we're going to use to draw everything we're going to talk about the tools and the templates that we use to identify certain areas in the market we're going to talk about discount and premium zones if you've ever seen any of our videos you know that we rely heavily on discount and premium zones when it comes to making decisions also scaling in scaling out levels these are places where we would get into the market or get out of the market and then we wanted to find trading logic some things that you need to be thinking about before you take position third we're going to come to mastery all right the mastery of the trader trading psychology lots of things go into that but really it's all about controlling your emotions a lot of people try to make that a bigger subject than it is it's really just about controlling yourself all right and we give you some tips on how to do that also the mastery of the trade what exchanges to use right depending on what type of trader you are your trade entry your management your exits and your risk management also for your execution your automation via limit orders based on predetermined levels that we did from the watch list and marking targets and execution of market orders based on those same levels the beautiful part about this system that we're getting ready to show you guys is that it doesn't matter if you're a, a long-term trader you can use these levels if you're a scalper, you can use these levels. And some of your biggest scalp moves and plays will come from the levels that we draw because we're drawing them from the higher time frames. And as we hit these levels on smaller time frames, this is where your larger moves tend to come in and you can turn a scalp into a pretty nice, like really decent swing play, right? Or even a positional play if it really moves that way. So what is the end goal for us here? The end goal is for us to outline a simple yet effective process for successful long-term swing trading and even scalping, right? We're going to break down some plays that you can make there. We want to help traders avoid the common pitfalls of cryptocurrency trading, the media bias, the emotional trading, the major losses and liquidations that lots of different traders experience in this market. We want to also help you build a portfolio of strong crypto projects that are invested in at proper times and levels. Worst thing that most traders do in this market is they hear about something, they jump into it, they don't do the research, they don't look at the charts, and they end up taking a loss in that position. We want to help you get away from that. And then also, the main goal for us here, right, is to turn losing traders into winning traders. If we can do that, then we're off to a good start. This is going to cut it for the intro video. We have lots of other information coming soon, but we just wanted to give you guys a preview into what we will be dropping next. All right. And these videos are going to be coming quick back to back. So you're not going to have to wait a long time to get the next installment. This is not like a TV show. All right. We're going to keep this stuff rolling out to you guys because we think it's important, especially at this time in the market, that you start to understand some of these concepts.
All right, so let's start off with video number two, building a watch list. This is exactly where you wanna start if you are a brand new trader. And even if you've been in the market for a while, if you don't have a watch list, you're doing yourself a bit of disservice. All right, so we're gonna talk about what a watch list is, how it's important, why you can use this, to your advantage, right? And how you can essentially just sort of build your portfolio from this starting point. All right, so let's get started. What's the purpose of a watch list? Why build a watch list? You wanna consistently track potential opportunities in the market and your current positions in the market. You don't wanna just invest and have some things sitting on Coinbase and not look at what the price action is doing. So the reason why we actually build our watch list in trading view is so that we can see the price action according to what we want to get in and get out on. So there's a lot of different reasons, but that's just one of them. It's really just to monitor what's going on. You want to stay focused on the goals that you define. If you have levels to take profit, levels to enter, the only way you'll really be able to watch them is through a watch list on something like trading view. It gives you a bit of more organization around your sense of thought where you're getting in, where you're getting out, how your positions are doing, if they're crashing, if they're rising, how your positions are doing in relation to the rest of the crypto market. A lot of this stuff matters when it comes down to you seeing whether or not your investment ideas are successful or not. You have to separate things, right? So organizing them in this way helps you get that perspective. Also, when we build our watch list, we build it on TradingView, as we mentioned a few times already, right? This is our hub for all long-term and mid-term trade ideas. We're gonna set them up on TradingView, we're gonna write notes about them on TradingView, and then once they reach these levels on the exchanges that we're trading on, we're gonna take action. So, what does it take? to build that watch list. Before you start, there's some things that you do need to research. If you're brand new to crypto, you do wanna learn certain things before you start to just invest in things, right? I would never tell anyone to invest in something that they don't have knowledge about. That's probably the worst idea that you can ever think about doing, okay? You wanna know about your, your space. So study the history of blockchain and cryptocurrency the types of cryptocurrencies, right? It's not just Ethereum and Bitcoin. There's tons of different utilities for these coins nowadays. It's important for you to know the differences between them. You wanna to get to know the space, you wanna to get to know the terminology, the things that people say. When it comes to FUD FOMO, what does that mean? If, you, if you're not aware, right, just study up, get your mind wrapped around some of the language that's spoken in these spaces. And exchanges, what coins do they offer? You want to research this because say for example you find a coin and it's not offered on coinbase where else can you go to find this particular coin right so do some research on your exchanges as well and the stipulations around these exchanges and what you're going to need to give these exchanges as you sign up and then ultimately you want to pick some coins now there are two coins that i will say are the only blue chips in crypto at the moment this is bitcoin and ethereum so these are two coins that I would say and recommend to be in anyone's portfolio, no matter if you're invested in any other coins. If you just invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum, I would not be upset with you. But these are the blue chip, sort of blue chip stocks, if you will, that you should have in your portfolio, even if it's a small amount. Now, also, you want to find crypto projects that are trying to solve problems in industries that you are interested in. What do we mean by this? Well, you may see that there's some problem in an industry that you're very interested in, right? Now, it could be video games, it can be art, it can be a number of different interests that people have. But it should be something that you know about a little bit, right? And understand the problems of that particular industry. Look for cryptos that are trying to solve those particular problems and see if they have a nice, strong team behind them to actually solve that problem. If you find something like that, that's really a good project for you to invest in because not only do you know the industry, but you have a good idea that the team may bring something to bear when it comes to actual progress in a project and bringing a crypto from sort of point A to point B. And these are the things that you wanna pay attention to. Crypto itself as a space is very large, it's very, intense and it's very confusing to those people who first start so a good way to give yourself a leg up in this and not get lost in the sauce is to try to invest in cryptos that fall somewhere within your industry that you know about or have some kind of interest in right that's going to help you a long way as you start to move forward starting with coin research large cap research versus small mid cap research okay 
Now, your large cap research is going to be done for you for the most part through most media outlets. You can go to YouTube, type in Bitcoin. There's 70 million videos, literally, like that you can go through to learn about Bitcoin, learn about cryptocurrency, learn about blockchain. You can sit there and get a full day of this information. So things like Bitcoin, things like Ethereum, you're going to hear about them on a regular continuous basis because these are the larger cap coins, the number one, two, three, four coins. You're going to hear a lot of news about them. So your research is going to be done for you when it comes to these coins. But when it comes to mid to low cap coins, you're going to have to do your own research. Now, there's some resources that you can go to. Here's a number of them. You can go to CoinGecko, CoinMarketCap, Masari, ICO drops, coin market cow, crypto news research websites, things of that nature, and then contract audit websites are new ones that I'm starting to research a bit as well. If you're going to get into any of these coins, right, you want to get a better idea, especially if it's a mid to low cap coin on who the team is, whether or not their contracts has a, you know, literally a rug pull set up in them. There's some things that you want to dive a bit deeper into. So all of these different sites, we're going to give deeper dive and tutorials into, right? But these, these are the places that you start in regards to resources. CoinGecko, you can do a lot of research there. You can go into the Ether scans and the BSC scans to really see who the holders are for particular cryptos. And if there's small allocations of a lot of crypto into one wallet or another, right, then these are sort of warning signs. There's a lot of different ways for you to research deeper into projects to get an idea of what's really going on behind the scenes and whether or not this is a good investment for you. These are the websites that I've sort of used in my journey to try to capture some coins of value. They all will give you different types of information, right? So CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap. You know, you get your top 100, top 1,000 coins, but you can also dive a bit deeper into researching who the holders are, get news on these things, et cetera, right? Masari is a deeper level research type of website, right? ICO Drops focuses on the brand new cryptos coming to market. CoinMarketCal focuses on some of these schedules, right? So if you want to see if a, if a project's keeping up with its roadmap, CoinMarketCal is a way to sort of map out things that are happening with specific projects and whether or not they're meeting their goals and their dates. Of course, you want to keep your eye on the crypto news. Some of this research, you're going to need to go to the actual websites of these coins to get information. And then, of course, your contract audit websites. You want to make sure that the smart contracts, if there are some, are not setting people up for a rug pull and not allocating everything to one specific wallet because these are the easy ways for you to get involved in something that's going to wreck you at the end of the day. Another thing to watch is the project roadmap, as we mentioned before, and upcoming events. You want to make sure that these projects are hitting their marks when it comes to their roadmaps. Number of whale holders and coin allocations. This is another thing that we think you should definitely pay attention to, right? And we mentioned that you can get a lot of this information from the Ether scans, from the BSC scans, and just taking a look at who holds the majority of the coins is going to give you a lot of power when it comes to making decisions. You also want to dive deeper into the social media for this particular coin, the community of the coin. And there's some thoughts that we have around social media and the coin community right itself that we think you should be aware of that we're going to talk about in later videos. But also you want to make sure that the project team are real people, right? Go to their social profiles, see if they're real people, if they're really interacting, if they're really doing things in real life. If it, if it seems like a robot or if these people are anonymous, then it's probably not a good idea to go ahead and jump into these things also you want to track these projects closely for updates follow them on twitter make sure that you're aware of what's going on in these communities because just like that you can you know turn a good situation into a bad situation if you're not paying attention make sure you're doing that so here's some considerations when it comes to your watch list there is such a thing as risk and reward, especially when it comes to investing. When it comes to your watch list, you want to build your risk versus your reward based on your market cap. All right. So your lower market cap is going to have a greater risk and reward. So with that being said, you should not have a ton of lower market cap coins in your portfolio. The majority of it should be higher cap coins because you have a lower risk. And even though you're going to get a bit of a lower reward, you're still seeing major swings in crypto that you're not seeing in other asset classes. So the reward, right, it's still pretty good if you ask me. And you're just going to lower your risk by investing in things that have higher market caps. But 
With that being said, there is something or a piece of terminology that traders like to call cutting zeros. You're looking for very low to mid cap coins with a few zeros before the dollar amount. Essentially, these are less than a penny, all right? Less than a penny cryptos with low market caps and the more zeros that you have before it reaches one cent, the better essentially, right? Because every time you essentially cut a zero out of that price, you're hundred Xing your position. Now, this is very possible in bull markets. We're going to talk about this a little bit, but this is the concept basically, right? You want to look for these type of coins and these are your really risky plays. The more zeros and the lower the market cap, the greater the moonshot. So these are similar to lottery tickets. If you're looking for these type of things on coin market cap, coin gecko, these are the areas of, you know, really big opportunity that is the riskiest play in crypto, if you ask us, right? So they're not always risky though. In bullish and volatile markets, these opportunities can yield you 100x or more, 1000x. These are the coins that literally don't have enough market cap to push them up to the levels that they should be at, right? Because if they do have value, then they're eventually going to get up to higher numbers in price. But if nothing's really moving on these, these are also, you know, sort of the worst coins to be in because they're only controlled by a smaller amount of people in the market and they can swing dramatically. In sideways markets and in uncertain markets, these are not viable plays to us only in bullish type of markets. And really it's only when Bitcoin is bullish and sort of pulling back and altcoin season starts a bit. This is the only time that it's really viable for us to look at these type of plays, right? And also in bearish and volatile markets, these are the first coins to go to zero. Why? Because they have the smallest amount of market cap. But if you want to take a shot, right? If you really want to take a shot, the best shot to take is to try to cut some zeros in the market. So what is the work that we need to do to create our watch list? This is what we basically need to do. We want to build a threshold criteria that a coin or a project needs to meet before we consider them something to add to our watch list. All right. Now, the easiest way to do this is to create something called the altcoin scoring rubric. Well, you don't have to call it that, but that's what I call it. And this is just basically an Excel spreadsheet that gives me information that I need to know in order to make a proper decision about an altcoin. There's a lot of different things that you're going to have to research. And in order for you to put it all into one place, right, and then score it, this is the best way that you're going to start to find consistent ways to research projects, consistent ways to get an idea of which projects are good or bad, and then have an idea of what you actually want to put some money behind and invest in based on your own scoring rubric, right? So I know you guys saw that spreadsheet. That's an entire tutorial in itself, but just understand that you want to create something like this so that you have an idea of things that look good to you versus things that aren't necessarily a good play, right? Just based on your own criteria. You want to build a portfolio watch list on TradingView for the altcoins that make the grade. So if your altcoin score is high on your rubric, say, yes, this is something that I want to get into. I'm going to put it on my watch list in TradingView. And I suggest that you start small and expand as your knowledge grows. You don't have to put everything on there in one day, right? Start small with one or two coins. As you learn how to research, now you can start to add a lot more onto that watch list. And eventually you want to make this a pretty substantial pretty large watch list. The more that you're able to see in the market, the better, but you don't want to watch everything. So most coins that you'll want to watch and track at any time is about 20. If you're able to track more then by all means do more. But the most that I do is maybe around 20, 25, 30 coins, right? And with that, I'm able to keep a pretty straight focus on some things that are large cap, mid cap to low cap and take advantage of things when they happen. So there are some common mistakes that lots of people make when they first get into trading. And we think it's important for us to really dive into this before we get into our next point. If it seems like someone is selling something to you when they talk about a coin, think twice about it. Okay. Now there are some common words that these people will use things like utility, community, meme, influencer slash celebrity. If they use those words in the same sentence, run it's a rug pull all right and this is just based off of experience this is all based off of just you know just watching things in the market and seeing how they turn out okay over the course of time this is what i've noticed also if it seems too good to be true it is too good to be true even in crypto this is the fact all right 
Solid crypto projects do not need influencer promotion or marketing campaigns to entice investors. Just ask yourself, does this crypto solve a problem? That's probably the easiest way for you to get a better idea or understanding on whether or not this is something that you would invest in. Is it solving a current problem in the world and how well is it solving it? All right, just like anything else, if a crypto meets those standards, chances are it's a, it's a pretty good investment, all right? The next thing I want to talk about is crypto communities. As you begin to research coins, you may come across some communities that intrigue you, right? You may go on to Twitter and see some communities. And this is stuff that happens with a lot of NFT projects, right? The community kind of just builds people up and says, yes, this is the best community that you could ever be a part of. We're going to do so many different things. They promise, 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 and then they rug pull, all right? So, being part of a crypto community is sort of a double-edged sword. You're able to get the best information, but you sort of become trapped and entrapped in that community. There are communities here in crypto space where if you sell anything, you're looked at as sort of a, a you know, they have to out you out of the community. Why? We're all traders, right? And the goal is to trade these things, not necessarily hold on to them forever, but you have people in these communities that will help you create your bias that isn't necessarily the best bias for you to carry into trading. So you don't want to become a victim of community bias and the herd mentality. Why is this? The herd is the easiest group to lead to slaughter. If everyone's thinking the same way, it's very easy to manipulate and draw these people in a direction and completely chop everything off, right? That's how rug pulls happen. This is the easiest way to overinvest in something and lose a substantial amount of your capital by following the herd. Some of the largest rug pulls happen in the most friendly and active communities. Think about all of these NFT rug pulls that are happening, and I hate to bring it up, but it's happening, guys. And if it's happening, it's a reality. And if it's a reality, then it's something that we have to talk about, right? We can't hide away from these things. So just be aware of the community that you're talking with. Be aware of who the people that are running and moderating that community are. And they should be front facing. None of this should be sort of in the background hiding. And I think crypto, you know, being as Satoshi Nakamoto is, you know, sort of not a real person that anyone can put a finger on. Everyone thinks that they should run their crypto projects that way. I think it's a new age, guys. You have to be accountable and responsible, and you have to be front customer facing if you want your project to really have any validity in the eyes of real people. You want to review the community chats for issues, right? If there's a lot of issues and robotic like messages, right? So if things seem to be sort of auto answered, right? And you're seeing the same response from moderators from a lot of different questions that people are asking or if people don't seem happy, may not be the place for you, right? And think of a community chat for any crypto, any Discord, as customer service. That's a customer service line, if you ask me. Is the team providing good service? If they're not providing good service, it's a very simple way for you to say to yourself, if these people can't even answer text message questions, what happens when they get sick of doing all of this, okay? They're gone. And that's why the rug pulls happen. You can try to get ahead of the game if, in fact, you are part of a crypto community and you see these type of things happening in that community. So there are some best practices. We are going to use color codes and sections to create our watch list. And why do we do this, right? We just want to know what we're looking at very quickly whenever we go to the charts. The hardest part about making decisions is over analyzing things. I want to be able to go right into my chart, look at what I have, look at what I'm doing, look at everything based on color codes and make decisions right away. It's not about, you know, analyzing things for three hours and then coming out with a hypothesis. No, good traders are able to come to the market, know what they're looking at, know what they're waiting for and then execute. All right. And some of the easiest ways to do it is just by color coding what you're looking at. All right, so we're going to create a system for high, mid, low cap coins on this watch list. We're going to do it by color. We're going to create sections, right? The coins that we're watching and the coins that we're currently invested in. You want to know the difference between the two so that you understand what you're playing with in your portfolio, the levels that you should be watching, the actions that you should be taking, right? And we're going to track this. Tracking this list consistently 
daily, weekly, depending on what type of trader you are, right? You could be a positional trader, swing trader, scalper. You want to track this list on a pretty consistent basis because these are where a lot of the setups are going to be. You want to look for entry and exit opportunities always when it comes to your watch list. All right. So let's go ahead into some watch list examples. We're actually going to build the watch list from scratch. Right. We're going to take a look at a couple of things on how we would mark our watch list up and, you know, We'll find some coins and, you know, we'll dive into it. And by the end of this little short segment, we'll have a watch list. All right, let's go. Okay, folks. So here we're going to go ahead and build a watch list. And to build a watch list is very simple. This is the one that I've previously built that most people see in our videos. But we're going to start brand new and fresh. All right, so we're going to create a new list. And whenever you build a watch list, you want to name it. So we'll just call this one tutorial watch list all right and this is just basically for tutorial purposes so we'll go ahead and build it now you'll notice that there's nothing here okay and we're still on the bitcoin us dollar coinbase chart so since we know that bitcoin is going to be one of our main coins that we're going to buy into it's blue chip right bitcoin and ethereum we can simply easily add this to the watch list and there's a couple of different ways that we can do it if i right click just sort of into the dark space here i can put add BTC to watch list, and then they'll ask me which one I want to add it to. Or I can come up here, click add symbol, type in the symbol, and add it to the watch list as well. All right. So if you have a number of different coins that you want to add all at the same time, that plus button up here is the easiest way to go. But if you're actually on the asset itself, already on the chart, just right click and add this to the watch list, tutorial watch list. Now, as we put it up there, you'll see that it did populate right in the top corner there all right so let's go to ethereum now the easiest way to move from asset to asset or crypto to crypto in trading view is just to type it in okay so i'm going to type in eat all right now i'm in the crypto section to look for different particular brokers that have ethereum all right now i'm buying ethereum for the long term okay it's a blue chip you know so we're going to buy it from coinbase all right this is the exchange that we're going to buy ethereum from so we choose that particular one now, again, same way, we're going to go ahead and click add Ethereum to watch list, the tutorial watch list, and now it pops up under Bitcoin. All right. So these are my two blue chips that I'm starting my watch list with. OK, but once I start to add more coins, these may actually get lost in the sauce. So the way that I want to identify them, OK, is through actual tags. So being that these are blue chips, I'll label them blue. And what I'll do next is section this these two off. I'm going to right click, all right, and I'm going to add a section, and that section is going to be called blue chips. What we want to do next is start to line up some mid caps, but we want to create a brand new section for them. So we're going to right click into this area here, and we're going to click add a section, all right, and we're going to kind of drag that below, and we're going to name this mid caps. All right, now our mid caps. They're going to fall into a special category. Remember, we're on CoinGecko right now. OK, so we want to look for things that are under five hundred million dollars in terms of market cap. All right. So let's say, for example, we come to the second page, we start to do some research and we see Uma, we see Kava, we see a number of different coins that we've done our research on and that we actually want to take advantage of in the mid cap area. All right. So let's say, for example, Uma is one of them. We'll go back to trading view. We'll just go ahead and type it in UMA. OK, into the blank space. We know that we can find this on Coinbase, which is our preferred exchange. All right. So we'll pull that up. We'll right click. We'll add Uma to the watch list under tutorial watch list automatically shows up under mid caps. Mid caps again. Right. These typically won't be labeled right off the bat, but we did do something with Uma earlier. So it was labeled. Mid caps, they're going to have a different designation as blue caps, right? So different target, different section. And we can add as many of these as we want based on our research, right? Let's say, for example, we wanted to add Kava, okay? We'll come back to trading view, type it in, K-A-V-A, -A, all right? And we'll find the exchange that is currently trading on, all right? And what we're looking is for something like a USD pair or US dollar. I'll see if we can get this at Kraken, all right? So... We know that we have to now use the Kraken exchange if, in fact, we're going to be buying Kava. 
All right, but it really depends. Whatever exchange you like to buy into, it's up to you. All right, but again, the process is the same. We're gonna add this to the watch list and we're gonna give it a designation here and tag it. These are mid cap coins and eventually you'll get around to smaller cap coins. All right, so what is the area for small cap coins? We gotta go way down here, right? And let's go to maybe page four, all right? And smaller caps, we're talking about less than 100 million, right? So we gotta keep scrolling, we gotta keep going, gotta keep going, gotta keep going. Now we're getting somewhere, okay? So now we're under the $100 million mark. These are small caps, okay? These are, you know, essentially coins that haven't really made it yet in the crypto space, but they have some possible room for growth. All right, so let's say, for example, we see Venus, XVS. We'll come back to our chart. We'll type it in, XVS, all right? Now, the smaller the cap, usually the less number of exchanges you'll find it on. So sometimes you may find this very hard to get on an exchange that actually offers these types of coins, right? But we lucked up. We're on Binance, okay? Let's do Binance USD versus XDS, XVS. All right, and we'll go ahead and again, we'll go ahead and add this to the tutorial watch list. And again, this is a small cap, so we're gonna label this. I like to label the small caps pink, all right? And then from there, we just need to create that section again. And we're gonna label this small caps. All right, so hopefully you guys are starting to see what we're getting here, all right? We have a watch list full of different cryptos and eventually you'll have tons more of these right and your, your sections will really start to fill up but what we did was we sectioned them off we have all of the blue chip things that we're watching we have all of the mid caps that we're watching all of the small caps that we're watching right so we understand just based on market cap where these things are moving and you know you'll start to notice how small caps move in relation to mid caps and how they move in relation to large caps right and vice versa all right, but there's one more piece that we need to add to this, and that is actually what's in our portfolio. So we want to add one more section. We want to name this portfolio, all right? And portfolio simply denotes what we're invested in, okay? So from our blue chips watch list, we're going to drag Bitcoin down here, okay? We're going to drag Ethereum down here. These are things that are already in our portfolio, okay? And we can drag the portfolio section up, you know, just to kind of put it at the top to make sure that we're, you know, always able to track what's happening with our portfolio. But now we're just able to add in more blue chips into the watch list to see whether or not we actually want to put them into our portfolio because we bought them. Okay, guys. So this is the simplest way to do it. If you ask me, you want to create sections, right? For portfolio, blue chips that you're watching, mid caps that you're watching, small caps that you're watching. And as you get in and out of positions, okay, all you're going to really need to do is move them up, move them down according to whether or not they are actually active in your portfolio. That's how we build the watch list. This is how we get prepared to get ourselves into trades, actually get prepared to get ourselves into a space where we can build the portfolio. And this is really just the first step that we're going to need to do in order to understand where we want to get into the market, where we are when we're in the market and possible opportunities that may be coming down the line in some of these lower cap coins. All right, back to the lesson. All right, so when it comes down to watch list allocation, there are some things that I think we should address here. Now, everyone's going to have a different number when it comes to what they think you should allocate for your watch list. Our numbers are here. Okay, so we think about 70% for blue chips, 20% 20 20 for mid caps, 7% for low caps, 3% for no caps. And what we mean by no caps, we're, we're going to explain that in a second. All right. So blue chips, these are the safest investments in crypto, as we've stated before, right? Now, the way that we view it is the market cap is somewhere between 500 million, $1 billion or more. Okay. These are the top coins in the market. These are the coins that will take the longest to die in the market, which is why we say if we're going into a bear market, if you have 70% of what you have in blue chips, you're not going to be affected as bad in a bear market than if you were to invest most of it in mid caps or most of it in low caps, right? Those are the coins that are going to die the quickest. Your blue chips, they'll bleed out a lot slower if in fact they do bleed out, okay? So second to those are the mid caps, larger potential for growth than large caps, 
and safer than low caps, but still risky, right? Your market cap's anywhere between 100 million and 500 million, and these coins start to show up somewhere around 125 on CoinGecko, right? So if you go to CoinGecko and you look at the rankings from market cap, these coins start to show up around number 125, okay? Now, these are pretty good coins to invest in. I would fluctuate between, you know, 70 to 65 to, you know, maybe 75% for blue chips and then make the difference up with mid caps, right? I'm not going to move the low cap and no caps too much, but mid caps, I can definitely make up a lot of room with that, right? Because these, again, are still high in market cap. And in regards to where they sit in terms of where crypto projects are, they're pretty high on the list, right? Not the top 100, maybe, but they're still pretty high on that list. Next, you have your low caps, right? These are long shots. I like to call them lottery tickets, all right? Now, the market cap for these are somewhere around 100 million to 10 million, all right? Now, if you get down into the $10 million area for market cap, you're really starting to play with fire at that area. Now, some of these coins are going to start to show up around number 400 on CoinGecko, and these are really long shots, folks. You shouldn't you know, put a large substantial amount of any investments into these type of coins just simply because they're too low in market cap, right? They haven't really proved themselves in the crypto market yet, and they could definitely crash to zero, okay? Now, these are what I like to call no caps. These are the super long shots. Lottery tickets times two. Market cap is below 10 million or they're currently funding. They don't even have a space on CoinGecko or if they do, they're showing up after thousands of other coins. ICO drops is a good way for you to find some of these pre-market coins. And believe it or not, if you catch a really good no cap to low cap coin, these are the things that you can turn $100 into $100,000, you know, within a year. But you have to be smart about what you're doing. You have to understand exactly the problem that that crypto is trying to solve, the team behind it, the research behind it. You know, you have to understand things on a lot of different levels before you're able to catch these type of moves in the market. This is where the greatest areas of opportunity lie, but also the greatest areas of risk. All right. So just understanding these sort of four levels of how you should break down your portfolio will give you opportunities sort of in all of these areas. And you won't be affected so much if one of these areas, you know, or a couple of these areas really go down you'll still have some some dry powder left if you're able to follow the system that we're showing you guys here and how to allocate your watch list and build this up into your portfolio. All right, so what are some of the key takeaways here, right? Your watch list is gonna help you track the market, track your current positions, define your focus through organization of what you're doing, right? You gotta see what you're doing before you can actually do it. Watch list, they should be research oriented. You're not just gonna put a bunch of coins on your watch list. You want to become familiar with how to research cryptocurrencies, right? So starting off, this is sort of the starting point that you're going to need to get good at if you're going to find some of those gems and some of those no caps that you're going to want to put onto your watch list, right? The research is very important. Also, your watch list should be diversified between large, mid, small cap coins and some no cap coins if you can find them. And last but not least, you want to start small and expand as you learn more, okay? And also... This is an iterative process. You're not just going to build your watch list and let it go stale. This is something that you're going to be tracking daily, so you should update it daily as well. If you get into a position, then things should change, right, in your categories. If you get out of a position, then things should change in your categories, right? It's a very simple process, but hard to maintain once you get going with it, right? But the better you're able to maintain it, the better you're going to be able to make decisions and track things in the market so that you're successful as a trader. This is the third installment of how to be a successful trader in cryptocurrency. What we're going to talk about today is marking targets. Let's go. Marking targets assist you in a number of different things on your charts. And if you don't understand what we mean by marking targets, right, we mean drawing levels finding areas in price that we're interested in in regards to making a movement. So it's all about preparation. It's all about anticipation of what you're going to do in the market. You want to identify areas in price action where we're going to take action based on the current market structure. It's all about anticipating where price is going to go and what we're going to do when price gets there. We want to mark levels off for entry and exit based on a solid set of rules that we're going to define for you guys here in this lesson. 
Also, it's all about execution. These levels are only as good as the trader who marks them, meaning this is not a plan for what we could see in price. This is a plan for what we will do once price reaches these levels. This is not about saying that price may go up if this head and shoulders completes here. No, we're saying once price hits this level, buy. Once price hits this level, sell. This is how we approach the market and the levels that we see that have been effective sort of since January, and that will be effective because we understand what we're looking at in price. There's a certain algorithmic way that price moves, and all we're doing is taking advantage of that. Smart money price action trading techniques. It's not just a term. It's something that we're doing in the market, all right? So we're going to show you guys how to execute this as well. Let's dive deeper into it. There are some basics that you guys need to know. There's some key levels and zones that we're going to start to draw out on our charts. The first are discount and premium zones, price zones that are defined by previous market structure. All right. Now, all we're doing is finding a range, finding the center point of that range and then breaking out sort of two other levels from that center point to understand where we want to buy and sell. So our intention when it comes to this is to buy when price is in a discount or a bargain zone, just like you would do in a store, just like you would do in a wholesale market. You want to buy things at a discount. And then we want to sell them when price is in a premium zone. So this is the entire idea behind discount and premium. Just having these zones on your chart gives you an idea on how to play it from a longer term perspective. And when you may want to kind of just sit on your hands versus when you want to be more aggressive once price reaches certain levels, there's a lot of different things that we look at when it comes to this, All right? Discount and premium. Now there's also scaling in and scaling out levels. Now, these are specific levels of interest in price, right? That are defined by previous market structure. And a lot of these areas are defined by either areas of liquidity, right? Where there's equal highs, equal lows, or areas of fair market value gaps, right? Imbalances in price, right? Or even order blocks. These are specific areas in price that we're going to key off of to make decisions once price reaches those areas, right? So our intention for these are to either buy in incrementally or sell off incrementally once price reaches these levels in our charts. There's a difference between premium and discount zones and scaling in and scaling out levels. Zones are meant to be played in a way that is more long term. Buying and selling in zones, you're not doing it in any specific way. You're, you're just trying to find something in that zone to take advantage of. Scale in and scale out levels are actual specific levels that you want to get in at with the price target, right? So there's a difference in what we're doing here. So think about it like this, discount and premium, wide range of where you can get in. Scale in, scale out, these are specific levels where you want to get in, get out, or at least attempt to, right? Moving forward. As we define these levels, there's certain price action targets that we're going to look for. So you may have heard some of this stuff before in smart money trading, you know, videos from other people, but we're going to break them down very simply. What we're looking for is imbalance, all right, fair market value gaps. We're looking for large candles with no immediate price action to the right and the left of the candle. The way that we use this is to say the market has not traded to a sufficient level, right? It hasn't painted over this area or traced over this level in the sufficient way that it likes to. So it needs to come back here. So we'll use this premise in price to see where price may be going back to, right? Where it's drawing to. Also, we're going to use areas of liquidity, right? Easily found even areas in price action, no matter the time frame. It can be one minute, it can be five minute, it can be one hour, it can be the daily, all right? If we find very even levels of price action, this means there's liquidity there, okay? And where's liquidity? That's stop losses, that's limit orders, that's a lot of different traders sitting there waiting for something to happen in price. And we take advantage of these areas, right? This is where the orders sit, the stop losses, the limit orders, as we said. And then, of course, order blocks. I'm pretty sure you guys have heard this term plenty of different times, but really all an order block is, is a major reversal in price that's initiated by larger players, all right? They change the characteristics of price action. Price could be going down very aggressively and then boom, it'll start to swing up. It takes a lot of money and a lot of interest from the larger players to make it move at that point. And all you really need to know about order blocks is pretty much the same thing as imbalances. Price likes to come back to these areas, right? But for a different reason. 
For imbalances to refill it, but for order blocks, it seems that it's more to close out the orders of the bigger players, institutional players, so that they can take another crack at making an, an exchange in the market, right? But essentially, it's just like them closing their orders out, right? And the definition depends heavily on the time frame. If you're on a one hour chart, right, your order block is going to look different than if you're on a daily chart, right? So these are all things that you want to consider as you're starting to draw out your price target. And you do want to make some things a little easier for yourself by setting up some templates. You want to create templates in TradingView that's going to make this process of drawing out your chart a lot easier. Okay, so there's really, you know, a few things that you're going to have to set up in regards to templates, but these will help you as you view things on smaller time frame charts in relation to larger time frame charts. The most beautiful part about this system is that we're drawing everything out on the higher time frames. So if you know what you're looking at by these templates and you have an idea of how they look on higher time frames, it works on lower time frames, right? And I can zoom in really tight to price action and I would know what I'm looking at if I see a box or a line, right? I understand what the reference is. And that's really why it's important for you to have a good template set up as you start to draw things out. So we're gonna define the color, the shape for imbalanced liquidity and order blocks bullish and bearish side and we want to identify these areas no matter what time frame we're on so we're going to make them distinctive so that when we do zoom in right we have an idea if we're creeping up to a higher time frame zone then hey we know this zone now right and we can see it on the lower time frame as well we're going to add and adjust to templates as required if you want to draw something out that requires a template now you'll know how to add them in and you can incorporate that into your trading as well. All right, so let's get into some examples. Let's go into some live charts. Let's actually draw some of this stuff out so that you guys can see how it's done, sort of start to finish. We're going to create the templates. We're going to draw discount premium zones, and we're also going to set up scale in and scale out areas in price. All right, so let's go. Okay, welcome back to the charts. Now, what we're going to do here is break this down in regards to how we mark up the charts from start to finish. We're going to show you how we come up with our discount premium zones. We're also going to show you how we come up with our scale in and scale out zones. All right. The first place that we're going to start, though, is with templates. Templates make your life a whole lot easier when it comes to marking up your chart. So we're on the Bitcoin daily chart. And what we're going to do first is create the templates. There's a few different things that we're going to want to draw out on this chart. The first thing that we're going to draw out is some sort of horizontal line. OK, now there's a number of different horizontal lines that we're going to make. But the first one that we're going to make here is what we like to call just the dividing line for the discount premium areas. We just want a horizontal line. The easiest way to find this is to come up to trading view click on this little left icon bar here and find horizontal line now once you place one what you're going to be able to do is go in change the color so we'll make these dividing lines white okay to make them distinctive and we're not going to make them very big so we'll keep them at one point and what we're going to do now is click on this little three box with the plus signal here now we're going to save this drawing template as uh what are we going to call this let's call this uh dividing line or discount and premium okay now we have areas that are going to dictate to us what the area lines are for discount premium etc cetera, etc cetera, okay so we have that one what else do we need to build well we need to build some zones as well areas and zones are going to be denoted in a number of different ways the first area that we're going to look to build out in regards to a zone is an area of imbalance the second is an area of liquidity and the third is an order block. We're not going to draw these to the specific points first. We just want to draw the actual boxes and then label them. OK, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to come down to our shape tool here. And we're going to look for a rectangle. OK, we're going to grab that rectangle. And being that we have our magnet on, it's freezing us to the actual uh, candlesticks. So we're going to take that off and we're going to draw the first box here. OK, now the first box we're going to use, we're going to call that imbalance. Easiest way to draw these boxes is to either color code them, right, which we can do, or just add some text to them. So the first text in this box is going to be in balance. We just double click into it, all right, and we type in, okay, imbalance, okay, and with this, I like to make my imbalances pretty transparent, right? So I'll come to style, 
you know, there is going to be a background, but it's going to be pretty transparent in regards to the way that it's drawn because I don't want the imbalance to get in the way of the other price action that I'm looking at. I just want to be able to visually cue it. That's good enough for me at 2%. I'll go ahead and hit OK. Now imbalance is drawn. OK, so with this one, I'll come down and I'll save this as a template. And as you can see, I've created quite a few of them here. I've actually numbered them off, makes them a little easier to find. But for the sake and purposes of demonstration, we'll put save drawing template as, and we'll name it imbalance. Okay. You're also going to do this for liquidity. So the simplest way to do it is to come right back to it, change the color. All right. And now for liquidity, I do want this to be a bit more, you know, visible. So I'm going to make this color just a bit more easy to see. Okay, and I'm just going to change the text on the inside of it to say liquidity. All right, from there, I'm going to hit template and save as and then type in liquidity. When it comes down to your template, you guys can see I have a number of different ones here, right, that I've built, but chances are I'm going to get rid of a lot of these. The only ones that I really use are imbalanced liquidity and the next one down, which is going to be order blocks. Okay. So before you set up a template, just want to make sure you change what the actual template is going to look like. So in this case, we're going to do a bearish order block. Okay. And I want the style to be red. OK, because it denotes a bearish order block for me. And I'm going to save this as bear OB. OK, so save this as a template as well. We'll come back in, make one more change and we'll do a bullish order block. OK, bull or OB we will go in, we'll change the color to green, which will give us the template for this. We'll go save as and this will be our bull ob okay now we have all of our templates for the most part there's one more that we're going to set actually two more all right so we'll get rid of this box here well you know what let's just leave it the only other thing that we're going to need to do is our scale in and scale out levels so usually we use horizontal rays for this and in order to get one, you just come up here and same place where you dragged your horizontal line, there'll be a horizontal ray. And we're just gonna place one line there, okay? And on this, we're gonna double click it again. This will give us an area to put in text. So this will be our scale in area. Now you can choose whatever color you want, right? Scale in for us, we like to leave it at blue. We'll hit okay. And we're gonna make sure that we save this, all right? So this will be Scale in levels, we'll save that. Okay, hit okay. And now all we need to do is come in, double click on this again, change this to scale out. And change the color, which I like to make my scale out areas orange. Okay, click back into this box and save this as scale out. At this point, Right. If we go into templates, we have everything we need. What we're going to do is we're going to get rid of all of this stuff now. Because being that we have our templates, the next thing that we need to do is identify the areas in price that we're going to work with. All right. So this is the Bitcoin daily chart. And when you start to draw these levels, I recommend that you zoom out almost as far as you can. So even though we're on a daily, we're actually going to start this on the weekly. Now, when I first look at price, Things are very condensed here into weekly candles, all right? So it's seven days of price action in each one of these candles here, right? Lots of information that we're just really condensed down into one little area. But what we want to do is start to look back through the history of Bitcoin price and pick a good time to sort of start our analysis. Now, what type of analysis are we doing here? All we're doing is we're trying to find areas in price action that price launched from and where it stopped. What do I mean by that? We're looking for the lowest lows and highest highs in price based on a relatively recent time period. So we're only gonna go back from maybe say two years, okay? Let's do this by starting it at the, let's say new year, um, which is maybe around, let's say December of uh, 2020. It may be a little bit too late. Let's go back to, 
you know what? Let's start January of 2020. All right. This is a good area to start. And actually, if you wanted to, you can start with these lows here. OK, so let's blow this up a little bit. And what we're going to use to get our mid area ranges is a very simple tool called the Fibonacci. All right. Now, our Fibonacci tool can be found here, right under where you were grabbing your horizontal lines in your raise from. OK, now it's called a Fib retracement and we set different levels up for our Fib retracement than people normally do. We do have a video on that if you guys want to check it out. But ultimately, what we're going to do is go from the bottom area of this wick to the top area of this wick. OK, now what this is going to do is encapsulate the entire range of price movement for Bitcoin all the way down from literally thirty eight hundred dollars. Right. All the way up to, let's say, sixty nine K, the all time high. Now, depending on which exchange you're drawing this up on, which chart you're drawing this up on, you're going to get different results for the all time high and the low that we're pinpointing here. Right. So depending on your exchange, you may see different numbers, but the premise and the concept is the same. So what are we going to do once we draw this fib from the low to the high? Really, all we're identifying is where we're starting, where we're finishing in the midpoint of that area. So we're going to come back to our, let's say, horizontal lines here, and we're going to place one at the top and we're going to place one at the the bottom now being that we didn't have any real changes for our horizontal lines right these are very easy to see they've always been white and they will stay white now what you want to try to do is kind of scale up a little bit all right take your magnet off scale up a little bit and to the best of your ability you want to place one more horizontal line sort of right at that center mark of where the 50 percent mark on that fibonacci is so all you're finding is the center point now once you have this here this allows you to take this fibonacci drag it down to the center point here okay and sometimes it takes a little finagling to get there but you'll get it all right and then you want to draw take a horizontal line again and find the 50 percent mark between the center line and the bottom of price where you start it, draw another line. Okay. Now, if you break out standard deviations like we do for our FIB, the next line up is essentially a 50% level to the top to midline. Now, what do we have here when we break it all down? Let's get rid of this FIB. What do we have here? At this point in price, we have two areas above, two areas below okay now the easiest way to break this down in regards to what these areas mean and what they are is to say this is an area of high premium price okay the next area below is an area of low premium price the next area below is an area of discount And the area below that is what we like to consider bargain areas. Okay. Now, how are you going to use this? Okay. I have an area of high premium, low premium, discount, and bargain. The proper way to use this is to say to yourself, I'm not buying Bitcoin until it goes into a discounted area. Meaning... If Bitcoin were to drop below $36,427, it's a good buy for me based on previous price action. The highs, the lows over the course of the past two years, okay? The center range of this range, larger range, this shows me that if Bitcoin bounces into these discounted areas, chances are it's going to move up, okay? Why? Because of previous price action. I can see. When price comes down into this area, and this was all of the price action from July of 2021, June and July of 2021, you'll see it'll consolidate here, and then boom, it'll shoot to areas of high premium price. So the easiest way for you to look at this is to say, I want to buy when price is in a discount. Do I think price will ever go back down to a bargain price for Bitcoin under 20K? Hey, it's possible, right? But ultimately, all you're doing here is saying, I'm buying at discounts and bargains, and I'm selling at low premiums and high premiums. So ask yourself a question. See how price spiked down into this discount zone here? All right? Let's actually blow this up into the daily chart to make this a little easier to see here. All right? So 
This is the daily, same outlay, just more information. So it's very easy for you to see here. Once price came down into this discount zone, just by having a discipline to buy Bitcoin under 36,427, every time it came out of this zone, you were in profit. If you would have sold before it came back into the discount zone, then you essentially put dry powder on the side to buy more Bitcoin again at a low price below 36,427, which is in the discount zone for it to rise again for you. So that's the premise that you're going to use when you're only using discount premium zones to trade. Okay. Now notice we haven't used any of our other tools yet. So this is where they're going to start to come in at. Remember, we're on the daily chart. And on the daily chart, you want to start to think about the things that we talked about before in regards to the price levels that we want to see. So where's the imbalance? Where's the liquidity? Where is the order blocks? On the daily chart, these are the levels that you want to identify first and then sort of drill down a little bit closer to identify where these levels are actually sitting. But what we're going to do is kind of start right from the previous price decline here. And what we want to understand is where we want to get out in these premium zones. Okay, so you have a low premium zone, high premium zone here. Really, anything above this level, above here, should be areas where we're taking some profits. If you understand the rules when it comes to imbalance, right? What we want to do is see these really big red candles get filled in price, right? Now, if you're approaching it from the bottom side, your targets for the price to fill this imbalance is right near the wick, which comes into this candle here. So the preceding candle, the wick, is where we're going to set our levels for this, okay? On movements up. For movements down, it's going to be opposite, right? So we're going to show you some of those levels as well. But we want to draw these horizontal rays based on what we're seeing in price currently, okay? So the first one we'll draw will be here, all right? And this is a scale out level. So we want to make sure that we're putting that into our chart. You see how it says scale out now, right? We just used our template, all right? There was one here where we can add another one, all right? And boom, you see this really big red candle here, okay? Now notice something. Just going from a discount area to the first scale out area that we identified, right? This big red candle. You see how price touched this area and comes back down, touches this area, comes back down? This is something that we showcase on our channel every single day, right? But this is how we actually find these levels. Big imbalance in price on the daily chart. We find the wick preceding it. This is the level that price is going to want to fill in regards to imbalances in price. All right, the next level up, we found it there. Where is the next one? Okay, so let's move over here. Zoom this in a bit. Where is the imbalance? It's right here, guys. Okay. This, not so much. You see that this was filled pretty much immediately. But this other level wasn't filled immediately. Okay, still kind of hanging out there. And again, we want to go ahead and make sure that we're using the proper templates on these so that we understand what we're looking at, right? That's a scale out. This is a scale out. And actually, let me change that color there. Had two different templates. That's why I was looking crazy like that. All right, so that's the scale out orange, right? Orange. And we want this one here also to be scale out position. So now I've identified three areas of scale out positions. One is at 45,515. The other one is at 50,480. The next one's at 55,845. And all we're gonna do is find as many of these as we can on the way up. Where's the imbalance? Right here, okay? There goes another one. So we're gonna place the scale out zone there. We're gonna go in, make sure our template states the proper thing. And now all the way back up, to where Bitcoin reached its previous all-time high, we have areas where price could potentially turn around, just like it did for this scale-out zone. So the way that you want to view this is that if I'm buying in a discount or scale-in area, okay, I want to get in, <laughs> in these areas and get out of some of my trade here. And again, this is a scale-in, scale-out, so we're not dropping a big bag on anything. And we're not taking a big bag on anything. We're ultimately using these positions to accumulate over time and then exit partially and let the runners run if that's in fact the case and that's what's gonna happen in price, All right? So we showed you how to get the scale out levels. All we did, find the imbalance, find the areas where price will want to fill into that imbalance, sort of the end breaking line of that fill. And you can see it honored the first couple of ones here. 
pretty substantially, all right? But that's where we're getting out. Where are we getting in, okay? So the scale in areas are also very easily found on areas of imbalance, okay? But the only thing is we're gonna inverse the thinking. For the discount and bargain areas, we are buying. So the levels that we find here are gonna be ones that we buy with rather than sell with. So looking under current price action here, okay? Just looking to the left, what do we see? Just in this little area here, areas of imbalance, okay? We also see what some would refer to as an order block. Now we didn't draw the order block um, on the top end, which we could, right? But we'll draw it on the bottom end so that folks can get an idea. Now, being that this is a daily chart, we're gonna use this final candle here as the order block, okay? Now, the order block may be and this is what most people like to think of it as. It's sort of the last area in price that price may go to to close out larger institutional orders, okay? So when we think about order blocks, we have to think about them in that respect. What we have to do is come get a rectangle, all right? And we just want to draw this out here. Now, this is a bullish order block, so it seems like we have the proper designation, and we'll drag that area out a bit, and we'll make sure that we label it correctly as a bull OB. Let's see how price action has fallen to this area or not, all right? Hasn't really touched this area yet. So this is right around the 30K level, okay? But if you notice, right above that order block, what do you have? You have an area of imbalance right here. You have another one right there. And you have a third one right there, okay? So what do we want to do in these areas of imbalance? Just like we were seeing them fill price to the upside, right? And our targets are based on those fills of imbalance to the upside. We also want to fill them and find them to the downside. We're going to find that wick, look to the next candle. If there's really no price action here in between these, okay, then these are areas where price may want to come back down to fill. So you actually have one right at the top of this order block, but the top of that order block is going to let us understand that this is sort of like the last level that we really want to go to. And again, right now, it's sitting at 30K for Bitcoin, right? So a lot of people are talking about that 30K level. This is what we're eyeing for 30K, all right? Sort of a touch into this level and potential real bounce out of that level, okay? The next level up where we're looking to scale in is this area of imbalance, okay? But notice that this is orange. We don't want that to be orange. So let's go down, choose the proper the notion. Okay, so scale in is going to be blue. Okay, so we got one level here. And remember, these are daily candles, folks. So this is pretty substantial price action. Notice that we're placing it at the bottom near the wick. All right, when we were looking for scale out positions, we were at the top of the imbalance. Here we're at the bottom. Okay, so the next one up is about, I won't call that one. You can say it's about right here. All right, so we'll grab another scale in. Boom, place it there. Make sure that we put our template in so that we know what we're looking at and there's another one say about right there okay so let's draw that line there now what we're going to do is a bit of an experiment i know the end result of this but if you've never seen this done before just finding these three levels let's see how this correlates with price moving to the left all right so we're going to scroll down and zoom out a bit and now we're gonna look at how price actually reacts around these levels. With this being said, at this point, you're essentially to the point where you're seeing exactly what we show on our daily videos on the channel. All of these areas of scaling in that we've drawn were based on previous imbalances in price that happened last year for the most part. But notice how price comes right back down into these levels and it just pings between the scale in and scale out areas in price. This is the way that we're able to sort of find the bottoms, right? Find opportune areas to scale into position, scale out of position for Bitcoin. For the most part, you have scale out, scale in areas where you're getting in, where you're getting out. You have discount and premium areas where you will want to get in, where you will want to get out and start to take some profits. This is enough for the longer term traders. But if you're really scalping, right? If you want to get in lower time frames to understand how things are moving now okay this is where this comes in handy for scalpers so what are we looking at here all right bitcoin is starting to move a little bit it's around 9 p.m eastern standard time this is a sunday okay but notice we have all of our scale in levels here right they didn't go away we have our discount 
premium zone here, right? This is sort of the dividing line between it. And this suffers scale out level. So how do we start to use this on a lower time frame? Well, we can say if price were to come down to discount zones or to these scale in levels, look at the way that price reacted to it before. Okay. Also, we can start to use some of these areas of imbalance sort of on the lower time frames to get an idea of where price may want to go. So again, let's go back, grab a rectangle. All right. And this is a real area of imbalance here that we may look to trade on. All right. And again, this looks like an order block. So we want to come back to our templates and we want to choose imbalance. All right. Changes the color, changes the tone. Now we're actually looking at imbalance in price, right? This is a target for price. We found one. What else do we see here? Okay. We also see liquidity. Okay. So I'll grab the rectangle, right? And right above this area here, you have a pretty nice set of liquidity just sitting right there. All right. Now, liquidity levels, you're not always going to be able to draw those exact. Um, let me take my magnet off here. You're not always going to be able to draw those exact to the point where you want them to be. But what you want to understand is that there is money sitting right above these highs here. Okay. So we'll come in. We'll make sure that we change this as well to liquidity. All right. And now essentially you've seen every template that we've drawn applied to the chart in a very easy, simple, straightforward way. All right. So... We're using some things on lower time frames for scalps. We're using some things on higher time frames to identify levels that price should want to go to. So if I'm looking at this particular price action right here, what am I saying to myself, right? I'm saying there's liquidity above that price hasn't really broken into yet. It snatched liquidity to the downside as well, okay? But this is a very even top level. I'm anticipating price to break back into this level. Why? You have areas of imbalance here as well. You have areas of liquidity here as well, right? I could easily just hold the control button and drag another area of liquidity here, right? So now what I'm starting to do is outline targets in price for price to go for. And if you've achieved all of your goals to the bottom side, your goals will be naturally to the top side. And as it breaks through this liquidity, that liquidity, imbalance in this liquidity here, we're going to be watching price to play a certain set of rules, right? If price dips into the liquidity and reverses, then we know that this is a more sustained down move. If price breaks into this liquidity, keeps going to take this liquidity and then breaks down, we may just be in a range. If price breaks through all of this, right, we may be turning bullish and you may be looking to scale out. Why? Because price has gotten rejected at these scale out levels before. So you see how just using a little bit of strategic approach to where you're placing your levels, drawing up some templates, this gives you a lot of insight and you do it from the higher time frame down to the lower time frame, you know, starting on the weekly, going to the daily, then jumping into your 15 minute, one hour charts. Okay. You start to get a real perspective on what price is doing, where it may be going next. And you're going to be able to follow along with all of the different things that we're showing you day to day to day to day in price if you're able to follow along with this drawing out your discount and your premium zones drawing out your scale in and your scale out zones making sure that your templates are something that help you once you visually dial dial into them all of that stuff is going to make you a much more effective trader when it comes down to you managing the price action managing how you're into and out of trades and actually managing the levels that you're taking action on all right, so hopefully this has been helpful, guys. Uh, as far as outlining these levels, we did all of that pretty quickly. So if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments. We'll answer them. No problem. Let's go ahead and dive back into the tutorial. Okay, so bringing it all back full circle, let's talk about some key takeaways when it comes to marking your targets. Your levels are marked to define areas of execution, right? As we showed you guys in, in the brief example. Levels are only as good as the trader's execution, right? So if you're not going to pull the trigger at these levels, guys, then there's no sense in drawing them, right? You want to be proactive as price gets to your levels. And right? you want to understand what you're doing at these levels and why you're drawing these levels out, right? That's really all the difference there. 
that it's going to make in whether or not you execute. Now, all levels are marked based on the same set of rules and balanced liquidity order blocks. You guys saw that in the live example as well. Discount and premium zones should be traded differently than scale in and scale out levels. As we mentioned to you guys before, the scale in scale out, these are specific levels where you're going to be setting limit orders. The discount and premium zones, they're not necessarily so strict in price, right? You can kind of get in anywhere as long as price is trading between these two levels. You can get in anywhere in a discount, get out anywhere in a premium, less strict. And creating templates in TradingView makes things easier to manage. And it helps you as a trader understand what you're looking at, no matter what time frame you're trading on. And they just, you know, they really help when it comes down to it. This is the fourth installment of our How to Be a Successful Trader in Cryptocurrency series and tutorial. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today, we're going to talk about mastering the trader. Let's go ahead and get into it. So, what are you? And what I mean by that is, what type of trader are you? Are you a scalp trader? Are you a swing trader? Are you a positional trader? Are you an investor? This is very important information for you to understand about yourself before you do anything in trading. And what I mean by that is, if your life is hectic, and you're super busy, and you have a full-time day job, and you don't have the time to sit there and watch the charts, then chances are you would want to be a positional trader. Why? It requires a lot less time in the market for you to be a positional trader, okay? But there's a certain way that you would want to approach the market as well if you're a positional trader versus someone who could be potentially a scalper. So if you're a chart junkie, if you're sitting there watching the charts 24 seven, always looking at crypto news, always involved, right? Always analyzing things, then chances are you're a scalper, okay? You want to see that fast price action. You want to get down and dirty into the one minute, five minute, 15 minute charts and really trade the market. And you have the ability to sit there and watch as things develop. Just understanding where you lay in time, right? And ability and availability, right? And your requirements that you're going to bring to the market is very important to determine which type of trader you are. So there's some characteristics and things that I think people need to understand before they make that decision, right? So if you're a scalp trader, you're on a very short-term outlook. The time frames that you're typically involved with are things like the five minute, the 15 minute, the one hour time frame at the max. Your trade duration could be anywhere from five minutes or less, right, to about four hours. In some terms, right, the majority of your analysis is technically oriented. You're not necessarily worried about what's happening with the news because you're only in a trade for a few minutes. Sometimes the news has no bearing ultimately on what the end result of that particular trade would be. So you don't watch the news. Most scalpers don't watch the news. They don't care about the news. They have a high level of trading competency though. So what that means is that they're very familiar with market structure. They're very familiar with how to trade, how to get in and out of very tight, small, ranging positions very quickly. And we show a lot of examples of this on this channel, right? I think a lot of what we do and a lot of what I do is more steered towards scalping. A lot of the examples that I show, we're scalping. We're not necessarily swing trading or finding the, the bottoms for positional trades, right? Because we like the price action and we know that we can do it with a little bit of hard work. And so that's what we do, right? Now, the next level up would be swing trader. Now, this is a person who has a short term to midterm outlook. Their time frames are going to be somewhere from 15 minutes to four hours, one hour in the middle. And their trade duration could be anywhere from one hour to around two to three days. Okay. Now, most times, just a one hour trade is not considered a swing trade. Usually they can be taken out within an hour and then that's that. But if you're in a pretty good swing trade, you're going to be in that trade for maybe two or three days, right? Or until the market starts to reverse its characteristics from whatever direction it's moving in. Now, these swing traders are also very technically oriented. They're not necessarily worried about what's happening with the news, but they will pay attention to it because if something happens within that two to three days that they're in a trade, it could affect them. And they also have a high level of trading competency. For the most part, they understand how the charts move as well, which is why they're able to capitalize off of lows and highs from price swings in the market between ranges or retracements on higher level time frames. These type of things is what swing traders love to see. Next level up, you have positional traders. 
mid to long-term outlooks, right? These are the folks who can't sit there and watch the charts at all. And they just want to take a position in something and wait for it to happen, all right? The timeframes that they're usually executing on is anywhere from a one hour time frame to the daily time frame. The trade duration could be anywhere from three days to about three months, okay? Depending on their risk profile, things of that nature. And these folks are seriously, heavily media and news oriented. They may like what's going on on the charts. They may understand what's going on on the charts, but this is not necessarily how they make their decisions, right? They're gonna make their decisions based off of thesis, hypothesis, all of these different things that they think is gonna happen with crypto just based off of the news and not necessarily the charts. They'll use the charts for analysis, but the majority of the way that they lean is based off of news and media. They have a mid-level of trade competency. And what I mean by that is technically speaking, they may know all they need to know about the fundamentals of the market, but when it comes down to the technical analysis side of it, they're not necessarily 100% there because they don't need to be. Their positions are gonna be held for years or months. And then you have the investor, the person with the longest term outlook. These are folks that are looking at a chart, if any, they're looking at maybe a daily or weekly four hour chart. Smallest you know, level of execution that they'll probably go in on is four hours, okay? Now, the trade duration for these folks could be anywhere from three months to multi-year positions, holding a position for 10 years, five, 20, 30 years. These folks are heavily news and media oriented as well, but chances are if you've been holding for this long, you do also have some technical analysis skills when it comes down to it. They don't necessarily have a low level of trade competency when it comes to trading itself, but they're not watching charts every day. Their entire goal, right, is to not watch the charts, which is why they are invested in this, they're not necessarily watching what's happening micro minute to price. They may check it weekly to see where the Bitcoin price is. Oh, did it go up this week? Did it go down this week? Doesn't really matter to them. They have larger positions most times, and they're just sitting there waiting for it to get to levels that they want to take some profits at. So these are the levels of trader. Understand that you have to treat the market a bit differently depending on which category you fall into. All right, so that's why it's important for you to understand what you are as you approach the market. What type of trader are you? Now, the next level that we need to talk about is where you are, okay? Are you a newbie, right? The way that we break newbies down in crypto is, is very simple. You just have a low level of understanding when it comes down to it, all right? But there are certain characteristics that I find when it comes to newbie investors, all right? And don't take that term as a um, sort of an insult, okay? It's a very common term that we use for all types of different things. And you shouldn't feel bad if you're a newbie. You're taking a step that most people are scared to take. So welcome. You are the folks that we're trying to bring up in this space, all right? So welcome. But we're going to talk about you a little bit here, right? as all newbies get talked about. Now, the newbies are brand new to trading, right? brand new to crypto. They're heavily influenced by media, friends, family, all of these different people that are telling them to get into whatever coin it is they're telling them to get into. They usually invest too much too soon, and they do it in an emotionally driven way. Okay, so all it takes is for a friend to come up and say, I made 100x on this coin. That will make anyone that's unaware of how this space works go to the bank, take out everything that they have, put it on a crypto exchange, and trade. Okay, that's not necessarily the best decision, but this is what newbies do all of the time. And the reason why is because they're usually taught by other newbies who just maybe happen to look up or they saw something on social media that gives them the idea that what that person did is also possible for them. But once they realize that trading isn't necessarily the game that they thought it was, they become the student. Now, the student usually is a person with less than one year of experience. It only takes you a few months to understand that this market is here to wreck you. And the only intention of the market and the bigger players in the market is to take your money. All right. So once you start to learn things like that, as a newbie, you become a student. These people are less influenced by the majority of media, but they still rely on helpful resources to make trade decisions, right? They'll still watch tons of YouTube videos. They'll still go and read tons of different books. And this is why we call them the student. They're in learning mode at this point, right? And it doesn't really matter whether or not the information is good or bad. They just want information. So they'll consume as much of it as they can within the time 
that they are allowed to, to do that. They still have no defined method or system to trade with, right? So they're kind of just taking shots in the dark, depending on what they think they need to do or what their mentor said to do or what the trading group said to do, because this is usually the time where people get into trading groups and go seek out mentors and pay hundreds of dollars for, uh, for courses and things that they could have learned for free on YouTube. It's all there, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure that some of you guys that may have actually gotten into mentorships have learned more in just these three videos that we've dropped for this tutorial for free than you've learned in some of these paid mentorships. A lot of it is just fluff and a lot of it is meant to catch traders off guard. And a lot of it is just regurgitated information that you can learn for free anywhere else. All right. So this is why being a student of trading is sometimes the hardest part of you coming up to speed, coming up to age, because you're learning some of the wrong things from the wrong people that aren't really there to help you in the first place, right? Now, these folks tend to take less risk, but they still enter at the wrong time based on emotions. Because here's the problem. A lot of these mentors, they're going to tell you where to enter, where to exit. They're going to tell you about all of the chart patterns. They're going to give you the full rundown of every candlestick that was ever created. They're going to come up with their own patterns and how they play them. But none of these things really bear fruit until you're able to manage your emotions in the market. Okay. And that's where a lot of these mentors go wrong. They don't focus on the person. They just focus on process. And they think that that's all a person needs in order to be successful in trading completely wrong. Again, process is technical. It's robotic, all right? It's algorithmic, but the emotions that go along with that trade are the variables that determine whether or not you're successful in that trade. And every real trader knows what I'm talking about. Now, this stage also determines the fate for most traders, because either you're going to get so frustrated with what you're learning in the wrong way that you figure out a way to learn in the right way, or you're just going to give up. So the student is the dividing line between whether or not you become a good trader or a bad trader. Now, there are the neutral lines that we can draw to say you will become a trader. And I think that if you've had plus one years of real world experience, you've really played in the market, you've lost money, you've made money, you understand what it takes to, to make a trade and the dedication it takes to do this, then I will call you a trader, but not before then, right? Not until you've gotten your feet wet, not until you've gotten your hands dirty, not until you've had your trial by fire. All right. Now, most traders are not influenced by media, right? But they still rely on trusted resources for guidance, whether it's a, a personal mentor or someone that they found that they really got really good information from and that they actually really learned from, right? Because those people are out there for free and you can find them on YouTube and a number of other different outlets, right? And ultimately you have to dig a bit to find these folks. And we understand that and that's what we had to do. And that's probably why a lot of people haven't found us yet because you have to dig for this information to really good, good information. It seems like the, the sensational stuff is what they like to put out there just for entertainment value because YouTube is about entertainment. But for the most part, if you want to learn something, you have to dig a bit deeper. Okay. So these are the folks that got to that level of digging to find the proper ways to invest in the market and make some good trades. They do have a defined system or trade method that they use, but they're still a bit undisciplined in regards to execution, right? And making things happen. And they do make non-emotional trade decisions most times. So they've learned how to eliminate the emotions. They've learned how to get over the anxieties and things like that. And that's what makes them a good trader. That's what starts to separate them from the student and the newbie. Okay. Now there is also the master. Now the master has two plus years of real world experience gained in the market. I think that Without two plus years of you really putting in time, effort, learning, education, trial and error into the market, you cannot achieve a level of mastery when it comes down to a number of different things. Not only execution of levels, but execution of, you know, controlling your emotions. Ultimately, right? You need at least that much time in the market and that much experience before you start to really get to that level of controlling yourself completely. So... They're not influenced by the media or mentors at that point. They are mentors at that point, all right? They may go back and revisit and rewatch things and, and talk to people of value to them, 
but they're not necessarily swayed by them and what they're doing because they found processes that work themselves and they understand that what you use to trade is not what I need to trade. And my trading style is different than your trading style. And so everything that you teach applies to what you do and everything that I do applies to what I do. We're two different people playing two different things in the market and we approach it two different ways. And this is the way that real mastery is gained and found because that takes a level of understanding that just most people don't have. When you're able to break away from the person who taught you, develop your own trade methods, strategies, techniques, based on the fundamentals of what you gained, then that's when you're reaching that level of mastery. You have your own defined method or system and you're disciplined in your execution and you do not get emotionally invested in any trade that you're taking. That's the level of mastery that we're trying to achieve. That's the level of mastery that we believe that you can achieve as a trader, but it's going to take the work, right? You're going to have to go from where these levels, wherever you are currently here on this, on this chart, right? You have to understand that there's always a level to climb. That's why the mastery isn't at a hundred percent because you'll never know everything that you need to know. There are some secrets, right? And people hold them close to the vest. And as we find out more and more and more, eventually you'll become more and more and more proficient. But as far as a master is concerned, you'll never be fully 100% competent in everything that happens in the market, all right? And just having that understanding gives you a better way to think about where you are. All right, now moving on. Next question is, who are you? Because training is going to help you figure this out pretty damn quick. Technical and fundamental analysis, that's only going to get you so far. All right? This is only 5% of the battle when it really comes down to it. Anybody can find a level on a chart based on a, a couple of simple rules. The real difference is whether or not you're able to mentally and emotionally hold it together when you're in that trade. All right, the ability to control the flow of your emotions that every single trader experiences is the key to your success. The primary emotions include fear and greed. Everybody knows about this, right? But there's also lots of swings of anxiety in trading. You can sit there and watch these charts and if price moves against you, you're gonna get really scared, but there's a level of anxiety along with that fear that most people don't talk about. Right? And it's the same thing when price moves in your favor. Let's say it's moving really fast in your favor. You get greedy and there's a level of anxiety that goes along with that greed, right? So the anxiety is really what heightens that fear and greed and makes you make crazy decisions when it comes to things that are happening on the chart based on price action. And here's the secret, guys. Price action is meant to move that way as a psychological game to make you make decisions that you shouldn't make in price. Now, your post trade reflection and the actions following whatever your trade was, that's going to determine your success. I know you've heard the term revenge trading. I know you guys have heard lots of different terms about not being an angry trader and going in and trying to make it all back after you lose. This is very true. And part of that last bullet point there dives directly into that point. You want to reflect, but you don't want to reflect in a way where you're upset about what happened, no matter what the outcome was. Either it's a learning experience or not. And it should be a learning experience every trade, whether it's a win or loss, right? So that post-trade reflection is important because that's going to help you make a better decision going into your next trade if you approach that with a level head. And that's all it's about. So the difference between winning and losing traders, it's a very simple concept that can be broken down in a very simple way. Losing traders are emotional. They're impulsive in their decision making. They don't think about what they're doing. They feel it out. They go by gut. They go by, oh, I'm going to miss it. Ah, let me push the button. They're emotional. They're impulsive, right? And typically those emotional impulsive things are because they're watching price action. And as I stated before, price action is meant to manipulate you, no matter how you look at it. The way that these charts print out, it's a manipulative thing, <laughs> right? Understanding that those movements and prices, what brings in that emotion, that's what makes you make the bad decision. Emotional impulsive response to the outcome of the trade is just as bad as the decision, right? Because if you react bad to a loss, if you throw something across the room, if you kick your computer and you're not able to trade anymore for another two weeks because you have to buy a new one, these are the things that wreck traders. These are the things that make people never come back. It's their reaction after 
the trade is said and done. Because while you're in a trade, you can have all of the hopium in the world that that thing is going to turn out better for you, right? But when it's all said and done, when you actually hit the close button, that's when the real reaction takes place. Being able to control the impulses from that also helps you save yourself as a trader, okay? The inability to identify mistakes or fix mistakes that they do identify will make you a losing trader. If you can't journal what you did wrong and identify what you did wrong, you'll keep making the same mistake. And if you do identify what you did wrong and then you continue to make that mistake, then that's the problem. These are the things that you want to identify as a new trader to make sure that you're not making these mistakes over and over again. Being unaware of what works for them and what doesn't. You want to make sure that you understand what works in your tool belt and what doesn't work in your tool belt. And if you have a firm understanding of that, then that helps you get out of the losing trader mentality and that helps you get out of the losing trader rut. Right? So to become a winning trader, you want to use an algorithmic driven decision making process. You don't want to make decisions based on emotions. Once you do, that's when you start to fall more into that loser category because you're doing things that are not part of the plan. Okay, You're sort of just winging it. And that's not what you want to do. You want to have a real plan should be based off an algorithm. If A and B happen, then I'm doing C. If A happens but B doesn't happen, then I'm not doing C. Very simple thing, right? But the hardest thing for traders to really understand that this is the way that you get rid of emotions. It's based on my algorithm, how I'm moving in the market, not how I feel. And then that just makes things a lot easier to accept because, okay, maybe I need to restructure and retweak my plan rather than, oh, I just made a bad decision. Then you blame yourself more for that, right? You see the difference in how you react to sort of a, a planned approach versus an emotional approach. Right, non emotional, non impulsive response to outcomes of trades. This is the way that you want to go. This is what you need to focus on. As long as you're not being emotionally res responsive to your trade and you're not acting on impulse because of those emotions, you're going to be okay. Okay, and the ability to identify the mistakes and fix them. If I can journal what I did wrong and then not make that mistake again, then chances are I'm building really good habits that are going to keep me in that winning trader mode. And also just being aware of what works for them and what doesn't, okay? Don't do the things that don't work and do the things that do work. This is what it takes. This is all that it takes. How do we eliminate emotional trading? First part is you have to have the ability to learn from your mistakes and your successes. And you have to set realistic goals and expectations. The worst thing you can do as a trader is set the goal that you're going to come into this market, make a million dollars in six months, and then never have to speak to anyone again and just flex on social media. That's the worst expectation you could ever set for yourself. You want to make sure that you're doing things in a realistic way. Understand, set a goal for what you're going to need to learn. Set a goal for what you're going to need to invest. Set a goal for yourself and don't make things harder than they need to be by setting expectations or having expectations of this market that just are not common. Most traders lose. Most traders lose capital. That's a perfect expectation for you to walk into this market with. Now, you can also offset that by saying that I expect to lose a little bit of money in this market, but I also expect to learn everything I can as I lose so that I can start to win. Those are the proper expectations to set if you're new, all right? If you've been around, you're an old dog and you're a vet, then you're essentially setting goals for the year and what you're expecting, you already know what's going to come out of this market, all right? But in order to eliminate that emotional trading, you have to set those expectations so that you don't psych yourself out when it comes down to it. You also want to be aware of your emotions and your impulses. What do you do? before, during, and after the trade. Pay attention to yourself. And you know what I found? It was very <laughs> it was very good if I recorded myself as I was in the trade. If I wasn't able to do it with the uh, video, I'm, I was able to do it with my voice. And just understanding how I felt at the point in time that I was taking that trade, how I was reacting, right? My emotions and my impulses based on what happened with price is all you really need to understand about yourself. Because if you understand where those emotions are coming in at, then you understand how to control them. And it's as easy as this. Price is moving against me. I know that it's supposed to go down, but it's moving against me very aggressively. Uh, uh, uh. I'm going to get out of the trade. I'm only going to take home a little bit. Versus, oh, price is moving against me. I know that price should be going this way. It's just simply retracing so that 
you know, it can fill this imbalance based on our rules. Price should do this. Price moves up. Price goes the other way. We stay in the profit of the trade. We don't push the button to exit. All of that is simply broken down a very simple line of where were your emotions and impulses during that price action. So being aware of them is going to help you pinpoint which ones that you need to sort of have a second thought about once they start to surface in the trade. The next part is just being aware of what you got yourself into, right? Like if you're going to be a trader, you have to understand that this is a bit of a learning curve that you're going to have to come up to in order to be successful. And a lot of people rationalize the experience by saying, this is my business, right? And sometimes you take losses in business and rationalize it in whatever way you want to, but be aware of what you got yourself into. 95% of the people who get into this business fail in this business. So just being aware of that will help you as well, okay? Understand and be aware of what works and what doesn't, as we always say before. And here's the real kicker. You want to practice. You want to set up demo accounts. You want to set up paper trading accounts and practice, practice, practice over and over and over again. And it doesn't matter if you win or blow these accounts. It doesn't matter. The entire goal, right, is for you to understand where you're getting in, where you're getting out, practice those things, but you also practice your emotional responses to how you're trading. What you're really trying to focus on is where you're entering and exiting based on your emotions. Pay more attention to your emotions than practicing the entries and the exits. Understanding how you're going to emotionally react in a trade is really all you need to do to turn a bad trade into a good trade and vice versa, not let a good trade turn into a bad trade. Also, you can use small test accounts. If you really wanna play with some live money, use a small test account, put $100 in there, trade on very small leverage, get an idea of what the market is actually reacting like on that broker, all right? And then you'll have a better idea of how you may react when real money's up to play. When you start playing with larger sums, this is not something that we would recommend right off the bat. Start with the smaller accounts, get an idea of how leverage works, right? If you've never traded on leverage before and then start to increase incrementally, not by large amounts, because that's the easiest way for you to blow an account out of the water, especially if you're unaware of how these larger accounts move once you start to leverage them and always journal your experience. Journaling your experience is going to help you understand where you were emotionally as these things were taking place. All right. And time alone will help you define your emotional armor. Just being in the market, pushing these buttons, it's what it's going to take for you to eventually come to that emotional state where you're not affected in the trade. A few other tips here, some best practices. After entering the trade, do not watch your PL number. Watch your targets, okay? Watching PL, that's something that will throw your emotions all over the place. You don't want to do that. Stay focused on your target and your price targets, all right? Follow a plan, an algorithm, a process, etc. Don't follow your emotions until you have experience in trading this way. Until you're able to win seven, eight, nine times off of a gut emotion, do not follow your gut. Follow the process, follow the plan, follow the algorithm, and eventually your gut will start to follow that algorithm as well. And then that gut will turn into a much more positive thing for you to go off of if in fact you're going to trade off of gut feelings. Embrace your mistakes, right? But only once or twice. Don't become the person that's always making mistakes and not fixing them. The most times that I'm going to allow myself to make a mistake is once or twice before I take a step back and say, pause, let me take a deeper look at what I'm doing wrong here. So you want to embrace your mistakes, but don't keep making those mistakes. That's the worst thing you can do. Leave the charts, go find a distraction, something funny. If you're in a trade, all right, and things aren't looking too good and, you know, you've protected yourself in that trade and you just need a release, go watch something funny. It seems to turn the tide in the market sometimes when you do that, all right? You're just taking your attention off of that stuff and putting it to somewhere where you're going to be able to enjoy things a little bit and laugh a little bit and then come back to your charts, all right? Usually when I do something like that, I end up in a better position. Allow the time and the market to do their jobs. Sometimes the market's not going to move in your favor right away. Allow time to do its job. And if you do, chances are you may end up in the proper perspective when it comes to that trade, right? And create your narrative, right? What are you doing, right? Are you sniping? Am I sitting in position waiting for price to come so that I can take my shot? 
or am I the fighter, right? Am I sort of going back and forth with the market? How am I approaching this day? Or am I the chess player? Am I just gonna sit back, give a little bit, take a little bit, right? Until I'm able to corner the market in the proper perspective. And no matter which one you are, it's all about positioning, understanding your approach. Create your narrative, and this is the one thing that's gonna also help you eliminate some of the emotions when it comes to trading. And again, keep a journal to track your progress. This is the best thing that you can do. All right, some more final warnings that we'd like to give around trading emotions. Losing breeds careless traders. Things like revenge trading, over trading, pushing the reset button on trading strategies. These are all things that will just keep you in that losing trader circle. And eventually you're going to become indifferent to the market. And this is how you're going to quit. So never revenge trade. This is the level you want to get to if in fact you do want to be a better trader. Revenge trading is the easiest way to blow your account, right? Or over trading, taking too many trades in a day, right? You're spending all of your money on commission. Even if you do happen to come out with a very nice trade on the day, you're going to spend half of it on your commissions just trying to catch that opportunity. So scale back a little bit, wait for the proper opportunities and then take those. These are the things that we think, you know, kind of just brings losing traders in that circle. Revenge trading, over trading, and just trying all of these different new strategies every other week. You're doing something new. You're buying a new indicator. You're listening to a new guy on YouTube. Find somebody that gives you really good information, two or three people, and stick with those folks. Okay, learn from them. That's the way that you start to really lock in. All right. Also, winning breeds careless traders as well because people become overconfident. They take larger positions and then they end up getting liquidated. Very common tale in trading. You're ignoring the little things in what you did to become a winning trader. That's always something that happens to winning traders. And you're over trading and under evaluating. You're sitting there not doing the things that you would normally do for your analysis and you're over trading trying to get more and more and more out of the market and in all reality, you're just becoming greedy, right? So it circles right back to that beginning emotion that we were talking about. Now, when things get tough in this market, there's a few ways to deal with losing streaks, all right? Now, I showed you my 12 loss losing streak. You know, if you're able to tell a story like that, just let me know in the comments. Did it drive you nuts or what did you do in order to get over that losing streak to hit the reset button per se? Here's a few things that I did. I just detached from the market. I didn't trade. I took family time. I took vacation time. I pushed the reset button, literally a life reset button. Because without doing these type of things, you're going to focus on the market. You're going to focus on those losses. You're going to focus on trying to get back. You're going to focus on some other strategy that's going to help you win and reclaim all of those losses. That number is just going to burn itself into your head. And you'll always be trying to go back to fix it. Don't do that. All right, give yourself some time, detach yourself from the market, find a new approach, come back to it. Study, study techniques and methods via the practice and demo accounts. You do not have to be in live money trading. Study yourself, study your emotions as you do this on your practice and demo accounts. It's gonna help you once you reapproach the market. And just reduce your exposure, use less leverage, tighter stop losses. If you must trade, trade less, do not over trade you'll eventually get back to a winning way. And remember why you started. If you're ever on the verge of quitting this game and you understand why you started, then remember why you started. Just doing these things alone is gonna help you sort of recenter, refocus, do things like meditation, do things like go get a massage, take a road trip, go swimming, go sit in a sauna, go do something, go to the gym, anything but trading. Okay, and do it for a number of days so that you're not feeling compelled to come back to the market. And when you do, you'll have a brand new, fresh approach. Don't worry about the losses. All of that eventually will come to bear if you know how to fix your attitude and emotional state before you come back to the chart. And also when things get good, you know, have to know how to deal with your winning streaks, right? You want to maintain your focus. Remember the little things first that help you win. They will continue to help you win if you don't abandon them. Don't increase your exposure or your leverage, right? Use compounding methods instead. If I win a hundred bucks in a trade, that hundred bucks can be used to compound whatever percentage of my account I'm using for the next trade. Don't say, oh, I won a hundred bucks, so now I'm gonna kick my leverage up to 100%. No, <laughs> that's the wrong way to go about it. That's usually the time when you're gonna get ultimately liquidated in that trade. You wanna maintain your journal, right? 
Usually when you're winning, your journal can get stale. You're not capturing every trade as you did before when you were kind of breaking even or losing because you're not necessarily in learning mode anymore. But this is going to be your greatest teacher, your, your journal, right? This is your greatest mentor because you're able to go back and look at all of the mistakes that you made in live markets and demo accounts. It's hard to do that in any other book in the market, right? So use this journal. Make sure that you're still logging in this journal as you're winning as well. And don't become too overconfident. Don't revert back to bad habits, right? I think that's plainly stated. And continue building knowledge from reputable sources. If you find people that are giving you great insights into this market and you've been winning with them, stick with them, right? And continue to build your knowledge and always be trying to set new goals. This is the way that you will continue to grow as a trader. So what are the key takeaways for mastering the trader? You want to understand who, what, and where you are when it comes to the subject of trading and investing. Without understanding these things, you're sort of just shooting in the dark, taking shots without really understanding what your main objective and goal is. And in trading, that's probably the worst way for you to start, all right? Your emotions are going to control your results. You want to remain as neutral as best you can in the market. You want to set proper expectations for yourself from the start, all right? Don't get into this market thinking that everything is going to be 1,000x within 30 days. Set the proper expectations, folks. That way you stay in the market. And master what works, disregard what doesn't. We're going to say this over and over and over again. We show you things that work. Soon as something doesn't work for you, it's not the time to throw it out. Try it. If it works, sometimes you're able to break even, then maybe you should find a better method. If it works all of the time, then that's what you're using. And practice. Trade, entry, management, exit skills. You want to practice your emotional impulse and control. These are the things that are going to help your entries, your management, and your exit of your trades. Understanding the emotional and impulse control will help you with the trade entry management and exits. And keep an active journal, right? You want to make sure that you're able to log your activity in the market. It's important for you when you go and look back at what you did right versus what you did wrong. This is the fourth installment, just the second part of the fourth installment of our current series and tutorial, how to be a successful trader in cryptocurrency. Thank you guys for tuning in. Let's go ahead and get right into it. So before you start trading, there's some things that you need to make sure of. You need to make sure you're ready. Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. You want to make sure that you're ready on all of these different levels before you start to push those buttons. And I'm sure you guys hear me preach this all of the time, right? Just understanding where you are emotionally is what's going to help you survive in the game of trading. Controlling those emotions is really the key to it all. You also want to make sure that you do have some practice under your belt. You do have a demo account set up, paper trading account set up, and you're winning at least 55 to 60% of those trades. To me, it makes no sense for you to dive into a live money market, trading on leverage at that, without at least <laughs> having some practice under your belt. Now, when it comes to investing and things of that nature, right, longer term trades, that's not necessarily the best option for you, right? But if you're swing trading, if you're scalping, you should definitely practice those techniques on those smaller time frames, on those demo accounts before you dedicate any real live money to any type of leverage trading. And that's a rule that we follow. If I ever mentor anybody in this you know, community, that will be what I impose upon you. You have to put yourself in a winning position before you go live. And if you're not able to do that, then you just don't go live, folks. It's about preserving capital, not losing it. Funds are allocated, right? You got to have the funds to do it. And your first set of funds when you're first going into the market, these should not be things that you are relying on to pay your rent, to feed your family, to pay your bills. This is money that you're bringing into the market that is easily disposable. This was the money from the pair of sneakers you were going to buy this month, but you chose to sacrifice it to get into the market. This is the money that you were going to use to take that girl out, but she stiffed you. So now you're going to use it to allocate it to the market. You guys get what I'm saying? None of these funds that you first put in should be important to you in any real world way. If you get what I'm saying, if you do that, then you're not going to be hurt. If you take a loss and you blow your account, set the proper expectations for yourself and the market. That's first and foremost. Okay. 
have a firm understanding of what type of trader you are. These are things that we covered in the previous lesson. And the recommended starting approach for scalpers, you wanna start small as we stated before, test the waters, especially when it comes to leverage. If you're not sure on how to trade with leverage, don't do it right off the bat. Start with very small leverage right off the bat, right? And all leverage is, is just multiplying whatever money you're initially bringing into the trade. It's multiplying it by that amount. The easiest way for you to blow an account is use high leverage. Until you're aware of what you're really doing in the market, this is an easy way for you to lose. For swing traders and positional traders, you wanna scale into and out of positions. Nobody should ever drop a full bag, all of your money, life savings on any position for a long-term trade, <laughs> all right? Guys, the market is not moving that way for us to be making these type of moves right now. Now, there are times and places where that could actually be successful, but right now isn't the time. Not only is it important for you to understand where you wanna get in, where you wanna get out, but it's also important to understand the market conditions that you're in before you jump into a trade. You can set up alerts, predefined levels for limit orders to automate your entries and exits, which we're gonna talk about in this tutorial. And if you're actually placing market orders, you don't wanna just come to the chart and say, I'm investing today, so let's buy something. That, that's the wrong way to go, all right? You wanna be patient when you're placing your market orders in the market. So the first part, when it comes down to trading, it's actually finding an exchange. Now, a lot of people overcomplicate this when it comes to finding an exchange. What should I be on? Where's the coin that I want, right? Sometimes you have to do a little research, but there are no defined rules on where you should buy, sell, and hold cryptocurrency. There are some rules that we lay out for ourselves, but there's no real guidance in regards to where you should buy, where you should sell right? But there are some tips that we like to give. We'll talk about those in a second. It's best to diversify your funds and use exchanges based on your style of trading. So for example, I like to separate my funds and my crypto into two different accounts, basically. One is a holder account, right? And that's Coinbase, Coinbase Pro, something like Binance US, Crypto.com, a hard wallet. These are options for holder accounts. When it comes to leverage trading accounts, I'm really only using two sites. The first is Bybit, the second is Femex. Why? Because I can trade on leverage on these and it's a bit different than Coinbase and even Coinbase Pro where I'm not able to use that leverage aspect when it comes to my trading. So I break it out in two different ways and this is the best way that I approach the market when it comes to trading different variables and, and strategies in the market. All right, moving on. So when it comes down to picking exchanges, here are some rules that I like to follow. I wanna stay away from brand new exchanges. Anything that's brand new on the market hasn't really proved itself. These are the ones that have the least amount of liquidity and the highest chance of getting hacked. You want something that's been around for a while and has a lot of different security measures in place as you sign up for these particular exchanges. You always wanna make sure that you're using some sort of multi-factor authentication to identify that you are the person signing into your account, all right? The easiest way for you to give other people access to your account is to not use multi-factor authentication. You can get fished very easily and then you know can basically get into your account, wipe you out of whatever you just invested there. All right, so be aware there. Become familiar with the exchanges and the process of moving money to and from the exchange, right? So transferring money in crypto, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever it may be, it's a process that you had to get used to, right? Usually when we transfer something from bank to bank or say cash app to a bank, it's pretty instant. Bitcoin, not so much, right? It's gonna take a little time for your actual funds to go into your Bitcoin wallet, your Ethereum wallet, depending on whatever crypto you're, you're currently transacting, right? XRP, something like that's pretty immediate. But depending on the crypto, it's gonna take a little while for your transaction to go through. So you wanna become familiar with that, right? It's always a little weird when you first buy some Bitcoin because you bought it, but nothing's there. Right, So just be aware of how these exchanges work, the time periods that it may take for your accounts to come up to date. Also wanna diversify between your exchanges. For example, we use Coinbase and a hardware wallet for holding. This is like our cold storage wallets, right? Coinbase itself and an external hardware wallet, right? We, would, we do wanna hold some, ex some crypto externally, so we bought the hardware wallet for that. Coinbase Pro and Femex, to some degree, we use for active spot trading, right? So these are for things like scaling in, scaling out. We wanna get in and out of positions relatively quickly. We don't wanna pay a lot of fees to do it. Coinbase Pro, Femex, 
two really good sites to do that. And then I can also use Femex for scalp trading or leverage trading, right? Along with Bybit, which are pr probably my two main sites that I visit in order to do any type of leverage trading, all right? So I have money broken up between both of them. I don't have it all on Bybit or Femex, okay? So spreading your wealth around a little bit is the best way to go when it comes to these exchanges. And the easiest way to do it is just to break it out depending on what you're actually trying to achieve, different sources or, or exchanges for different methods and trading that I'm doing, right? So all of my scaling in, scaling out swing trades, Coinbase Pro. Long-term plays, the holders, right? Those are the ones that I'm putting in my cold wallet. And any scalping, leverage trading that I'm doing, I'm doing it on Bybit and Femex. You want to create an easy access method to pull up all of these web pages at the same time. So one thing that I found very helpful is just clicking on something like Freeze tab, right? Which is a Chrome extension or bookmarking everything, right? Or sort of pinning these websites to whenever you open your browser. These things help you just pull up your trade account very fast, make moves very fast if in fact you see something in the market that you want to take advantage of. All right, so these are all helpful tips and some rules that I follow when it comes down to picking exchanges. All right, if you guys aren't aware already, I am a price action trader and I believe that price action is king. So one tip that I always like to give folks is watching price action is what really makes the difference in your trading. All right, now some people aren't price action traders. They just sort of watch levels and pay attention to those levels specifically or whether or not their chart pattern is breaking out in the way that they think it should, okay? Everyone has their own method. But to us, the most efficient way for you to really understand what's happening with price is to watch it on a pretty consistent basis. Now, the most efficient way to become familiar with how price is gonna move in any particular crypto is to watch it. If I'm trading Bitcoin, I want to watch Bitcoin. If I'm watching Ethereum, then I'm trading Ethereum. If I'm watching Doge, then I'm trading Doge. You have to be able to sit there and watch your particular asset, whatever you're trading the most, you want to view it on a consistent basis. This is how you develop a quote unquote feel for price and what it may do next. You cannot develop your gut feeling for how price is going to move unless you're watching it regularly almost like a television show, almost like you're binge watching Netflix, right? I binge watch price. And this is why we're able to just pick sort of the right times and areas to do things because watching price action is gonna help you identify a number of different things. The most active hours of the market, if you're watching the market all the time, you'll know when it moves. Repeating patterns in market structure, you'll be able to see these as they start to get drawn out in price, especially ranges. Characteristics and volatility and price movement, again, this kind of harkens back to the time in the market. What time does the market become volatile? When is it quiet? When does it move the most? When does it move the least? These are all things that you can get from watching price action. And here's some tips. Set up a dedicated screen. If you're not able to do this, then you want to record your price action and watch a playback of it. There's a lot of different recording softwares that you can use nowadays. Just make a video recording. But you want to do it at the time that you would be playing the market, right? So if you can only trade at certain hours of the day, say New York session, for example, you don't want to necessarily be watching what's happening in Asia. You want to watch a few hours before the New York session, all the way through to a few hours after the New York session so that you understand how price moves within that time window, if that's what you're trading, right? So you don't have to have a 24 hour focus like I do. You can just focus on a very small time in price. Think about it like this. I'm going to trade before the lunch hour in New York. I need to understand how price moves from the 10 a.m. hour to the 12 a.m. hour only and study that. But somehow, some way, you have to figure out how you can watch price action, how you can dive a little bit deeper into what's actually happening with price. And then that way, you'll be able to make really, really, really good decisions off of your feeling on what's going to happen in the market and not always have to focus on things that are happening on your charts. Now, let's talk about the different types of orders that we're going to explain to you guys and show you guys once we dive into some of our deeper tutorials here, right? But just pushing the button is what we like to call the initiation of your first market order. Now, there's a difference in market orders and limit orders. Basically, market orders, you're pushing the button to execute when you want to get in and out of the market. Limit orders, you're sort of setting a level, waiting for price to reach that level, 
and it automatically puts you into the market, right? Which is why we talk about automating your process with limit orders. So your first few trades, if you're pushing the button for market orders, are going to be your hardest trades that you're going to ever take. The first real learning experience in the market is when you push that button for the first time. You see how trading works. You get the emotional swings that all start to play out. And you see your strategies at play in the market. And you understand how your emotions will affect your strategy as time goes on and as that play continues. So these experiences should be journaled. You should be writing all of this stuff down or at least trying to capture it in the best way you can during your first few trades as a trader. These are going to be things that you're going to look back on after you gain some experience and sort of laugh at yourself to say, yeah, I get why I was making this mistake now. I understand why things didn't work on that particular trade, but you won't have that context unless you write it down. Pushing the button will become easier over time. This is just something that happens. You start to have that paradigm shift and things start to get a lot easier in the market. Learning to wait for your desired conditions will be the hardest learning curve objective. Meaning, if you're executing market orders and you're coming to the chart and you're pushing that button, you're going to be anxious to push that button, especially if you've won some trades. Whenever you're first looking at a chart, whenever you're first analyzing the chart, unless something's screaming at you, your first instinct isn't to push the trade button. It's to look at what the atmosphere is giving you. What is the environment giving you first? Then push the button. So don't be anxious. You know, you can take tons of market orders in a day and definitely run up that commission for sure. Experience is going to breed your confidence for you. Establishing a real method of analysis and building a directional bias before taking a trade is really all that matters. So once you get your process down, once you understand how you bring your bias into the market, you're going to be able to push that button a lot easier. Whether or not you're able to control your emotions at that point, I think that's the hardest battle of them all. But just getting that method down is going to make that button a lot easier to push. Also, establishing a feeling around every trade, entry, and exit. Once you start to get that good, your patience is going to start to become your virtue. That feeling is going to tell you to wait instead of get in, get in, get in. And that's when you're starting to sort of turn that corner in regards to good trading versus bad trading, in regards to decisions that you're making as a good trader versus a bad trader. And your emotional reactions to price movements will begin to lessen. You won't get as mad if you lose. You won't get as excited if you win. You won't go into the trade with any type of emotional investment. It's all going to be neutral. This is the curve that you want to turn if you're going to be a successful trader. Your emotional reactions to trade outcomes lessen in duration as well. So even if you do get a bit emotional on a trade, it's only going to be for a couple of minutes. Whereas before, if you lost $5 in your account, you were throwing your computer across the room. Complete difference, right? And I'm guilty of that, which is why I can say it. But these are the things that are going to start to happen to you once you start to round that corner. Exiting positions, taking profits becomes a lot easier to do, okay? So sometimes just taking your profits is hard to do because you think price is just going to keep running and running and running in your favor. And sometimes you get wrecked doing that, right? So exiting when you're supposed to, taking your profits when you're supposed to based on your rules is also going to become a lot easier for you to do once you start to gain some experience. Now, limit orders. This is how we're going to automate the entry and exit points for our trades all right now remember those markups that we drew out in the first couple of videos that we put up okay if you've marked up your chart for discount premium scale in scale out positions you can set up limit orders and alerts based on those particular levels so we weren't just marking up the chart to mark it up we were marking up the chart to say okay if this is the level that we want to get in at let's set a limit order there and then let's go and set a limit order or a take profit level for where we want to get out of that trade. And once we do that, we've essentially automated our system, right? So we're going to reference trading view to set up the limit orders on our desired exchange. This method is only recommended for swing trades and positional trades, right? Sort of set it and forget it. You can do that because you're working on a longer time frame to where you can automate things. But if we're scalping, we're involved. We're watching the charts. We're there. We're at the table. Okay. You also want to be sure to check your market conditions as price gets near your levels. For example, if we set up a, a area to scale in, or if we think we're going to buy when price reaches a discount, if we're going into a bear market, that may not be the best play to make, right? So we can draw the level, 
but it has to make sense for us to take the trade at that level based on the market conditions that we're in. And scalping positions are best played via the market orders or limit orders you can watch as they get executed. So as we just stated before, if you're gonna do anything in regards to scalping, you wanna make sure you're able to sit there at the charts as things happen. Now, keeping track. Good traders, we keep journals, all right? The purpose of journaling is to capture the trade variables to reflect on success and failures. What did you do in that trade? What did you do after the trade? What did you do before the trade? Your journal should help you capture some of this. You can capture your initial hypothesis versus the ultimate outcome, and then try to figure out where things may have went wrong if they did go wrong. And over time, your journal becomes your mentor and your hub for trade information, especially if you're trading the same asset. I trade mostly Bitcoin on leverage. So everything that I do revolves around Bitcoin. So I'm firmly aware of how that price moves up, down, on the weekend, on Monday, on Tuesday, because I watch it and I journal it. And I'm able to reference that. No books are written that references what I see in the charts, right? So ultimately, this is my mentor when it comes to me making a decision. All of the tendencies and all of the variables that I track in my journal is what helps me. Not necessarily a, you know, what is Bitcoin book or any other technical analysis that I'm seeing out there. The journal is what is the hub for me when it comes to information. And journal tracking there's some considerations that you want to make when it comes to the variables, right? Now, we're going to do a full tutorial on this as well. You get a full tutorial on our journal and how we use it and, you know, the reasons why I put so much into it and what I track there. We're going to get a full tutorial on it. There's a lot there, right? But these are some of the things that we're looking at. Asset, trade entry, exit, duration, time frame, the session traded, our thoughts, feelings, emotional states before, during, and after the trade, our hypothesis versus the outcome, what did we miss? What were we thinking that turned to be true and turned out to be false? We're going to take screenshots of the play. We're going to do notations on it. And we're going to give ourselves a grade. How do we do in this trade? And we're not going to be brutal on ourselves, but we're not going to sugarcoat it either. And then we're going to outline what the next steps are for the next trade. The best time for you to think about what you need to do for the next trade is right after your last trade. And you may be telling yourself anything. I need to sit down for two days because I'm on a seven loss losing streak. Or we've won over and over and over again. Remember your basics going into your next trade. The next steps is the one piece that people don't add to their journaling and don't add to their trade recap that I think messes them up for their next trade. You want to know how you're going to approach the market next time based on what you just did. There is a cyclical building effect when it comes to trading. All right, let's get into some limit orders and automating this example. We're going to show you guys exactly how this is done on Coinbase Pro and TradingView. OK, so we'll take a look at how we do it for our account and you can apply this to really any other exchange. As long as you're marking up your charts the right way, then you'll be able to apply this method to any exchange that you're trading on as long as they have the ability to place limit orders, which essentially all of them do. Okay, so let's get into it. Okay guys, so we are now currently on Coinbase Pro and what we're gonna do is set up a limit order on Bitcoin to automate our system, okay? Now, we don't have a ton of money in this account to trade with, so we're gonna set our limit order for pretty low, but ultimately what we know is that we wanna get in somewhere around our first scale and level around 35,450, okay? So remember that number, 35,450 is the limit order area where we're looking to jump in and we want to get out around 45515 okay so these two numbers are going to be very important as we go in and place these orders okay so we're not going to place anything major okay but what we want to get you guys to focus on is the area where you want to start is in the trade all right so we're going to click on trade it's going to bring up this screen for us here and the first place that we want to go to is just to click on your asset all right and you want to make sure that coinbase pro offers your asset and depending on what you want to trade, you just want to go ahead and click on it. Now, we like to trade USD, right? Because that's the easiest thing to sort of convert back to after the trade. So we're going to make sure that we have Bitcoin selected there. Now, what we're going to do is scroll down a little bit because there's two areas that you want to really pay attention to. The first is what your order is going to be. Okay, so either it's going to be a market order or a limit order, depending on what you have right in your account, you can place a market order to buy a certain amount of Bitcoin. 
for the certain amount of USD that you have in your account. Now, when you're placing a limit order, it's a bit different. And remember, market orders, it's like you're pushing the button. You're pulling the trigger manually. You're doing this manually. Limit orders allow you to automate a bit of what you're doing. So remember that price, 35,450 is where we want to get in. And we just want to double check that. Yep, 35,450 was the number. Okay, so that's the limit price. We're going to type that in, 35,450. Now, once we have 35,450, we always want to check the amount of money that we have in our account. And being that we only have close to a grand in this account, we're only going to bet a very small amount of Bitcoin. So we'll do 0.001. All right. And hopefully that does give us a total order that fits within our bond. It does. Okay. So we have $35 order for Bitcoin that's sitting at 35,450. Now, of course, if we were really in a trade, we would bet a little bit more than that, but this is for demonstration's sake. All right, the fee that that's gonna cost us is 21 cents, and we can go ahead and place that buy order. Now, what we wanna do is sell Bitcoin at one of our take profit levels. So instead of setting the limit order up to buy, we're gonna set the limit order up to sell at 45,515. Okay, so let's go back to Coinbase Pro. And we're going to switch it to sell. The limit order will be, again, the 0.001 Bitcoin. And the limit price that we want to sell at is at, again, 45,515. Okay? So we'll put that in. 45,515. Okay? And at this point, that will be a total of $45.24 USD for a fee of 27 cents and we want to place the sell order now we have both a buy and sell order set up so all we have to do is wait <laughs> essentially for bitcoin to hit 35,450. all right now we have a current position in bitcoin so if we hit this sell limit you know it's just going to sell that amount of bitcoin that we currently have in our account but if you had none then you would be dependent on bitcoin hitting this buy level then hitting the sell level. And as long as it goes in that way, then you'll be successful and you'll actually take that profit home. This is gonna be the way that you're able to automate your orders in Coinbase Pro. And you can kind of take this thing and do it the same way in any other exchange. We have our orders set. Let's see what happens and let's see what Bitcoin does to make that happen for us. Hopefully this helped you out guys. Let's go ahead and dive back into the tutorial. Coming right back around to things here, we're gonna talk about the next piece, which is trade management. What are you actually managing in a trade, right? Well, there's your stop loss, and this is either a price level or a period in time that you're gonna exit your actual trade, all right? So there is such a thing as time stops as well, right? I'm gonna trade until this particular hour, minute, session, and then I'm out of there, right? Because I know what could happen in the next few minutes session, right? There are exits that way. And then most stops are set up by levels in price. And this is what most traders use in order to set up stop losses. You also wanna manage where you're taking profits. And same exact premise. You can exit off of a level or you can exit off of a period in time where I'm gonna take my profit. Also, as you guys already know, you have to manage yourself, your emotions, when you're in the trade. How are you reacting to price movement? Your anxiety to trade when losing or winning. Managing yourself really is the only way that you're gonna be able to control your account. All right. People can take losses and bounce back from that. No problem. People can take losses and kind of get stuck in the weeds and never bounce back from that as well. But the only way that they're able to bounce back is if they're able to control their emotions and then sort of rekindle what they need to in order to become a winning trader again. And this is what we're going to preach to you guys over and over and over again. So here's some tips when it comes down to trade management. You want to use the same criteria for trade entry and exits pretty much all the time. You're essentially trying to exit off of the inverse of the entry, right? So you want to make sure that you're using the same criteria and you're staying on the same time frame when it comes to your entries and your exits. One very classic way that people usually set up, right? And for scalpers, I usually do it this way. I'll start on the one hour, get an idea of the bias, which way the price wants to move. I'll zoom in to the 15 minute to get a better idea of, you know, more of a closer time frame to where I can really time things to enter either on the one minute or the five minute. Now, once I'm entered in, I'm managing that trade on the 15 minute chart. Why? Because it sits right in the middle 
of the lower time frame and the higher time frame that I'm analyzing both areas, sort of my execution point versus my sort of highest point to watch, the bird's eye view per se. And I'm sitting right in the middle of that to manage the trade. And if things swing in either direction on that 15 minute, it gives me a pretty good perspective to say, okay, if things are going bad, let me go back in on my one minute to really tighten, tightly manage this trade and then either exit or stay in the trade based on the conditions I see on the one minute because that's where I entered in the trade, right? You get what I'm saying, guys? The origin of where you start should also be where you finish when it comes to your exit. Manage those trades according to your trading style for sure has to be part of what you're doing for trade management. If I'm a scalper, I'm not going to manage my trade like a long-term trader and vice versa. Okay, so understanding your trading style and how you have to manage it all matters at the end of the day. And then you want to control impulses and emotions. Biggest thing that we've talked about in this entire tutorial is just how to control these impulses and emotions in trading. And the best thing that you can do in order to become a Winning trader from a losing trader is concentrated on this first. We're going to talk about a very sensitive subject at this point, stop losses. Most people don't use stop losses, right? Or sometimes traders don't use them. And it, it, this is the thing. Why should I use a stop loss if institutions can see it? Well, here's the thing, guys. Anyone can see your stop loss if they know where they're placed, okay? Which is usually behind equal highs, equal lows, you know, peaks in price, you're not really able to hide your stop loss as good as you think you're able to. Just essentially because of the way that we're taught and how we place them. So stop losses are going to protect your account from major losses and liquidations. That's why it's important for you to have them. But don't think that the institutions are the only ones that can see your stop loss. I can see them too. But it's much harder to climb back from a big loss than a small loss, even if they're multiple small losses. So the point behind this is to say that if I don't put a stop loss on and I lose 25% of my account, that's a lot harder to bounce back from than if I lost 25% of my account over time with very small losses. Because along that way, I'm going to make some wins too. And that 25% loss of my account isn't going to be as dramatic. Using stop losses in a strategic way is going to help you maintain your account. It's going to help you manage the risk, protect your account. This is the only way to stay in the trading game. If you're not using stop losses and protecting your capital, then this is where you get liquidated. This is where you don't come back, right? This is where you blow accounts over and over and over again no matter what you do you just keep making the same mistake and part of it is not using a stop loss the way that they teach stop losses is pretty ignorant to me now i have my own opinion you may have your own opinion but to us there's a better way to place a stop loss but it does take some practice and it does take some skill to do it the proper way so let's break it down stop loss the normal way, the way that is taught to most traders, is placed behind the entry point near previous obvious swings in price. If I'm short, I think price is gonna go down. My stop loss is placed above the entry, and it's usually placed above, let's say, a equal high, a high point in price. Okay, and depending on which time frame you're on, that's a pretty easy level to see for a stop loss. Now, if I'm long, the stop loss is gonna be placed below the entry, meaning I'm going to try to find a recent low, maybe on a lower time frame to place that stop loss. And that's a very easy place for price to go to take you out. These places that you're looking for are obvious levels in price action. They're nothing secret. Even if you're on a higher time frame and you think that you can save yourself by placing that stop loss way beyond where you think price may go, all it's going to take is for price to start to move against you and you're going to move that stop loss up. Believe me, brother, I've done it before. And eventually it's going to come to test it. And the reason why is because the market just has a way of finding levels of equal highs, equal lows, previous highs and lows. And it just wants to go there. If you place your stop losses there, of course it's going to hit it. Now, the thing about a protective stop loss is that it allows for losses in the account as the price moves against your trade. So if I'm placing it behind my entry point, then if price moves against me in any way, shape, or form doing any part of that trade, I am down at that point until either the stop loss gets hit or price reverses again and now I'm going back up. But placing stop losses at recent highs and lows in price puts you in the line of fire for these institutional liquidity runs. So if you go into the red 
all right and your stop loss is way behind where you entered and but it's at an obvious level chances are it's probably going to get hit <laughs> okay so don't place them there i'm just going to tell you guys again do not place stop losses at equal highs and lows unless you're forced to do that type of thing all right because you do want to protect yourself if you just get into a trade and price doesn't move in your favor then you want to place that stop loss in a protective position at one of those equal highs or lows essentially because you already have an idea that you may get stopped out okay if you want to protect yourself this is the way you do it i myself would essentially just exit the trade if it didn't move my direction within a pretty good amount of time people protect their accounts in many different ways sometimes it's just about hitting that button to get out as well all right now your protective stop loss it should always be placed based on your risk appetite always if you're willing to risk 200 dollars or so in price movement for an 800 dollars move by all means this is what you're going to do but always make sure that it fits your risk profile and you're not taking too much of a loss on any stop loss that you place and avoid these if possible this is what we say to folks and it's a new concept i'm not sure how many people place their stops the way that we show how to place them but you know we'll give an example of what it is here this is our preferred method all right now it's called a win lock stop loss there may be different names for it there may be a different person who's discovered this that i'm just not aware of but for the most part this is the way that we have started to trade and this is why we're able to maintain a high win percentage and not take losses because once the market moves in our favor we're going to take something home no matter what and this example the stop loss is placed in front of the entry point once price moves in a favorable direction okay we're in front of the entry point rather than behind it so if we're short the stop loss is placed below the entry if i'm long the stop loss is placed above the entry okay this protects a winning trade from quick price reversals the hardest thing to face in trading is when price moves up in your favor and then it just automatically turns against you and it sits below but doesn't really hit your stop loss it's not going for it, but it's just kind of dragging you out in the trade those are the worst trades to sit through having your stop loss in this area kind of helps you avoid that very bad day in trading also it produces small wins if the stop loss is hit but you don't take a loss and it allows the trader to re-enter at an optimal position it allows you to reset with the win under your belt rather than a loss stop loss will most likely be out of the line of fire from normal institutional targets we know that they're aiming for the highs and the lows in price so don't put it there and you'll be out of the line of fire now this does take a lot of practice to master but once you get the hang of it and once you're starting to enter in on price movements that are beneficial to you this is the best way to place a stop loss in my opinion because you'll literally set yourself up to never lose a trade all right if you're able to do this on a consistent basis now here's an example of what we're talking about let's say for example you have this movement in price here all right and you place a trade entry going long at this point the normal way to place a stop loss will be below those lows right so we're long we think that price is going to keep going up and we'll only give up that amount of uh you know our trade before we say you know what we've had enough it's time to get out so that's our protective stop loss but there's another way we can set a one lock stop loss as well okay so take that last candle there and what we're saying is that price moved up there okay and we set the win lock stop loss right there and our protective stop loss right there all it's going to take is for price to start to move a little bit and you'll notice that both stops get hit but notice what you're going to get from this price action okay now in all reality we wouldn't place a stop loss on price movement until it did give us some positive price movement right so ultimately we're going to be waiting a bit to place that stop but let's say for example that's all you had and boom you place your stop losses there look at what happens the first thing that you need to recognize is that the one lock stop loss got hit first but we took home something right we were long from that entry point to the long that we were up on price came right back down and stopped us out but we didn't sit through the rest of that sideways price action and we definitely didn't lose anything because you can also notice that the protective stop loss got hit as well what would you rather do take a small win or produce a loss 
because ultimately the outcome of this particular movement in price and whether or not you went won or lost leads to the outcome of the next trade. So the winning trader, they're in a position to strike again with a win, a little bit more compound interest to add to that next trade. The losing trader is actually discouraged at this point. Why? Because they set the stop loss and their stop loss was set right at the lows of that price action and look what price does it just spikes to catch it and then moves up this is a common scenario common 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 scenario in price and why do you think it happens this way for this exact reason guys once you have equal lows set or equal high set price is going to spike that area to take out those stop losses then turn right around on you but for the person who's using that win lock stop loss method you're already winning a trade you can come back in with a clear state of mind off of a win and reset just to take advantage of the next opportunity and probably that spike down to catch that protective stop loss will be the perfect entry area if in fact you were stopped out the first time you've given price some time to move and give you another area for you to get in at all right so just think about this and how this would play out and understand why we're saying that something like a win lock stop loss is a much better method to use when it comes down to actually trading these things all right and setting up stop losses now when it comes down to taking profits you want to make sure that you take home with yours which is part of the reason why we say use something like a one lock stop loss instead of a protective stop loss if you're up in a trade don't give it back guys if you don't need to right taking profit is one of the hardest skills to develop in trading but it's one of the most vital when you have a trade that's running for you, it's hard for you to get out of that trade, right? You have to develop rules around it. That's the only way you can do it because greed kills profitable trades every single time. So there's a few things that you're going to need to do in order to develop your best practices. You want to find some predetermined levels to exit and follow your rules. Don't go against your rules. These could be equal highs, equal lows, areas of liquidity, areas of imbalance, right? These are places that you want to enter as well as exit trades once it moves in your direction. Just following simple rules like this will allow you to take profit on a pretty regular basis, right? Scale out of positions, leave a little bit in for a potential runner if the market is in fact moving in that way, right? Best way to go when it comes to taking profit. If you find yourself trying to squeeze a little bit more out of the trade, get out of that trade. <laughs> That's the reality of it, all right? So let's break it down. You will receive wins, you will receive losses once you step into this arena. Most traders, they're going to lose before they win, but quitting is the only way that you'll guarantee yourself being a losing trader. They always say it all the time, right? The only way you lose is if you sell. Well, in all reality, the only way you lose in this game is if you quit. You can make bad trades, you can take major losses, but if you quit, then you end up a losing trader. At the end of the day, if you know how to reset yourself and come back and bounce back, then you can turn that losing trader mentality into a winning trader mentality. And hopefully you guys are getting some insight as to how to do that. Don't let emotions drive your decisions. Just don't do it. Whether you're winning or losing, you don't want to get caught up in your emotions. If you do go on a losing streak, reduce your risk until you're able to start winning. Reduce your leverage. Reduce your time spent on these charts and in the market. Get away from it. It will help you when you come back to it. If you go on a winning streak, control your greed by limiting your trades and maintaining your risk profile. Don't get over excited, right? Don't get over aggressive. That's the easiest way for you to start to fail in trading. Compound interest is what grows accounts, not higher leverage. Some people would argue with that, right? Some people would say, nope, leverage is the way to go. Compounding is stupid. They have an argument, right? But in my opinion, I think that Using compound interest, you know, using your winnings to maintain your winnings is the best way to go. Not just adding more leverage, trying to win it all in one big shot. That's how most traders get wrecked. When it comes down to it, mastering the trade, what are our key takeaways? We want to make sure that you're ready before you start. And you want to start slow. Don't jump into the market head first, trying to be an acrobat. You may not be trained well enough, you know, in order to make those type of moves. So make sure that you're starting off slow and you're finding the right perspective before you start to take trades. Find a trusted exchange with lots of users, lots of liquidity. The more liquidity and users on the exchange, the better. Diversify based on your trading requirements. Are you scalping? Are you leverage trading? 
Are you spot trading? Are you long-term hodling? Base your decision on your exchange, on your trading style, and it's a lot easier for you to manage things that way as well. You wanna keep an active journal. Make sure you're keeping track of what you're doing in this market. You wanna learn how to utilize market orders versus limit orders, the difference between the two, right? We showed you some of that. Also, trade management, it's all about controlling your emotions, all about controlling your impulses. You wanna use strategic stop losses the way that we showed you guys how to place them. Again, it's gonna take some practice for that, right? But if you get good at that, then you're really not taking any real losses in this market of any substantial means. And if you're able to maintain your profit and your account, then you will live to trade another day, no matter what. Also, you wanna make sure that you're taking profits often. Final installment of how to be a successful trader in cryptocurrency. We've walked people through essentially the starting point all the way to the finish point, which is building your portfolio. So welcome to the last installment of this series. Let's go ahead and dive right into it. So target portfolio allocation. Well, this all harkens back to what you did for your watch list. Okay. So ultimately what we're doing right now is we're translating all of those things that we watched on our watch list. And now we're trying to incorporate this into an actual portfolio. Now, we're not just going to go on a big buying spree and buy everything at one time and end up with this allocation. It's going to take time for your portfolio to start to get to this level. But what we're highlighting here is that your allocations aren't really changing in regards to what you're investing in from your watch list to your actual portfolio. You still want to try to maintain around 70% blue chips, 20% mid caps, 7% low caps, and around 3% no caps, and we explain what no caps are, right? Essentially, coins that are brand new. And go back to these videos and watch what we were explaining there. We, we kind of break it down a bit more in depth in that video. But take what you have from your watch list, and you, you want to apply that to your actual portfolio now, all right? So building your portfolio, how are we going to do it? You want to start small, right? You want to choose an exchange based on your trading criteria and your trading style. And you also want to become familiar with the exchange and the way that it works. How do you deposit money? How long does it take for the money to get there? How do you transfer money? How do you withdraw money? Okay. How do you actually trade on this thing and the types of orders? Become familiar with this all before you do any real active live trading on this exchange. Now, in my opinion, I always think it's good to start with at least two to five coins to build your portfolio. You want to have blue chips, definitely, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or both. And you want to have a couple of mid caps in there as well. I wouldn't recommend low caps right off the bat. I think that you have to do a little bit more research and let these mature just a little bit before you just throw them into your portfolio. So if you've done the research and you really understand what you're looking at, then low to no caps are accepted. But this isn't something that I would do with a brand new portfolio, right? After I've taken some wins and gotten some money, then that would actually be what I use to get into the lower cap coins. Only buy when the opportunity presents itself. So this is the biggest thing when it comes to building a portfolio. You're going to be anxious after learning all of this to just go in and find a position and get into it and see if it works. But you want to be patient. Wait for the opportune areas to buy. If you've drawn these levels on your charts, don't be so anxious to get in there and you know trade ahead of them. Let the market work for you and let the market come to the areas where you want to capitalize and it'll work. Now, expansion. Eventually, you're going to want to get around to adding more to your portfolio, right? But do it based on research. Don't just go because you heard someone say something and, oh, I'm buying this today. Don't be that guy, all right? Don't be that girl. The reason why is because you understand how important research is at this point and you don't want to abandon that. You don't want to turn into the mean coin investor after you have been the research-based investor. That's not the way to go, all right? Also, diversification, uncorrelated coins, layer one, layer two, crypto sector, the, depending on which crypto sector the coin is in. You wanna diversify what you're getting into your actual portfolio. So if you have all layer ones, get some layer twos. If every coin that you have always moves up, right, on the day that Bitcoin moves up, Get some coins that move up when Bitcoin moves down. You want to diversify, right? And this is the best way that we think you can do it. Just find uncorrelated coins, layer ones, layer twos. Depending on which crypto sectors you're interested in, you want to diversify into those sectors along with, you know, the, the main blue chips like Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
Now, when it comes down to managing your actual portfolio, there's a couple of simple rules that you really just need to pay attention to. It really all depends on what your ultimate goal is in terms of management. So if you plan to hold for years, okay, you don't have to sit there and babysit your portfolio. In fact, it's recommended that you don't. The price swings and fluctuation in price will make you panic sell to a certain degree if you're looking at your account every single day. If your goal and your intention is to hodl and not sell Bitcoin for five, 10 years, then don't watch your account every day, all right? It's almost futile to do so. If you're swing trading, you're gonna need to actively manage your portfolio, right? So if I'm in a swing trade and I'm only in for a few days, I need to sit in that trade and watch my portfolio. I need to keep the charts open to understand if price is swinging against me too aggressively or if my idea is wrong, okay? Because swing trading can start off really nice one day and completely reverse the next day. So you wanna be aware of that type of action if in fact it does happen, okay? Portfolio management is done best from the price charts meaning trading view. If you're able to go into your account on trading view and watch where the levels are in price that price is moving to, that's your best bet. Sometimes these brokers in these exchanges, they make it hard to view the price chart itself on purpose. If I don't know where the price level is and where my markings are for entry and exit, it's hard for me to track what I'm doing. So I'm tracking all of my trades via trading view rather than the broker themselves. Also, your portfolio should not grow beyond what you can manage. If you have too many coins in your portfolio and you don't know where things are allocated and you don't know what's happening with this wallet versus that wallet, you're growing too large. Consolidate things. Put things into a, a manageable perspective. That way you're not losing coins, you know, or losing wallets or losing opportunity based on just you losing track, right? You want to keep track of everything that you're doing. And of course, you want to set limit orders and stop losses to grow and protect your account. This is the automated way to do it. This is the easiest way to do it. And so ultimately, if you're able to set up these limit orders, you're able to just kind of set it and forget it when it comes to the market. Through our tutorial, these were all of the things that we were teaching and showing you guys. And hopefully at this point, you're able to do some of this stuff, like drawing up your charts, automating your trades, you know, setting your limit orders, not being afraid to push the button on market orders. And you're in a good spot if you're able to do that. Okay. So we're going to leave you guys with some parting words here. Some things that I think everyone should be aware of as we start to close out this tutorial. It's really all up to you guys. All right. Trading is not a team sport. It's an individual effort in most ways, but that's only when you're in the trade. No one should ever tell you when to enter, when to exit, how to enter exit, because that should only be up to you. It's your capital. It's your risk. So don't rely on anyone else, guys. And if you're able to do this, then you will go from a losing trader to a winning trader. I can almost guarantee it. It's not a team sport. It's an individual effort that sometimes requires a team to get you up to speed on how it works. But when you're pushing that button, it's only you. Finding a good mentor is important, but it won't make you a good trader. The only thing that's really going to make you a good trader is whether or not you're willing to go through that trial by fire that we talked about in the first session. So you got to be willing to take those bumps. You got to be willing to experience the losses and get over those emotions. Once you're able to do that, you're in a good place. Good traders are made from experience, not lessons and courses. I can drop a million tutorials. I can teach you guys something new every single day, but that doesn't mean anything. If you're not willing to take it to the next level and work on yourself to take those lessons in those courses, learn from those things, control your emotions and become a better trader. Fighting through the initial discouragement is what will separate you from the herd. As long as you're learning from your mistakes, you're going to be good, folks. And I had to learn this the hard way. I gave up at one point because I was following the herd. I was following what the new indicator my friend showed me. Or I was following the new guru on YouTube that my friend found. And, oh, he showed something that I never seen before. I went through all of that, guys. Which is why I created a YouTube channel in the first place. So fighting through that initial discouragement, fighting through those losses, it's what's going to make you a better trader. Never stop learning from the proper resources and your experience in the market through journaling. Make sure you keep in that journal, folks. It's very important, all right? 
So your portfolio should consist of a mix of large, mid, small cap coins in various different ways, right? Now, what you choose to invest in is completely up to you, but this is the mix that we think you should have in your portfolio. Also, you wanna start small, expand over time. Don't go and throw 20 coins into your portfolio right off the bat. Give yourself some time to learn and grow over time. And understand that patience is a virtue when it comes to this. You want to enter into positions based on predetermined levels that we've already showed you guys how to draw. Manage your portfolio from the price charts, not from the numbers in the portfolio. Okay, it's very easy for you to say price is going up 20% today and it's going to go 20% tomorrow. Well, if you look at a chart, if you're near that all time high, it's probably a good time to sell even after a 20% gain. Manage it from the price charts. Do not hold more positions than you can actively manage. That's a pretty simple rule to follow. And remember, guys, it's up to you. But I'm also here. If you understand the concepts that we've given you guys today, and if you've used some of this stuff and it's made you a better trader, then definitely please go ahead. Let us know that in the comment section. And just remember, guys, it's up to you. All right. So good luck. Happy trading. It's your boy Maestro. We do want to thank you guys for tuning into this tutorial. If you have any questions about anything that we've displayed, anything that we've talked about in this tutorial, in this group or sets of videos, please leave it in the comment section. We will be responding. Please like, subscribe, share, click that bell notification if you learned something today. And follow us on all of our socials. We do tend to kick up some information and talk out there as well. So it's your boy Maestro. This is the long and short. And this will conclude our tutorial on how to be a better crypto trader. Hopefully you found it informative. Thank you all for joining. Salute. We are out of here. Peace.